start to the day here on GCR. Good morning. It is a Monday edition of the program. I'm Clark. He's Griffin. Obviously a mixed bag of a weekend here in Baltimore. We will discuss all things Felix Batista throughout the course of this morning. Wish I could make you feel better about it. I can't. I'm not purposely going to try to make you feel worse about it, but I, I'll talk about it in one second. Coming up on the program today, we will uh, check in with our buddy Eric Arditi, Barstool RDT, Barstool Sports, Exit 52. Also, it's a Monday, so Jeremy Kahn will check in with us. And we realized we totally screwed up and, and missed it last week, but um, we will continue our summer-long celebration of the 40th anniversary of the 1983 World Series title when Gary Renneke, Orioles outfielder, checks in with us a little bit later on as well. So that's all coming up on a Monday edition of the program. Don't forget, we still have a great offer for you from our friends at Superbook. You sign up right now. You use the code GlennClark23 when you do. Will match up to $250 on your first bet, win or lose. Again, superbook.com. Download the Superbook app. Use that code GlennClark23 when you sign up, and we'll match up to $250. Um, my column will be coming today at pressboxonline.com. I, I've tried to find the right way to state this. I, I don't believe that the Orioles season is over or doomed because Felix Batista is hurt. I mean, let's, let's cover this on a couple of... We don't know for sure that Felix Batista won't return. We're making inferences that are reasonable to make given the nature of a UCL injury and the ambiguity by which the Orioles are describing it. When we hear these things, it's reasonable for us to fear the worst. But beyond that, even if Felix Batista is done for the season, I don't believe the season is over. You know how I know that? Because they played two more baseball games this weekend after he got hurt. Crazy thing. Season's not over. But this is the nature of our society and our sports media society at this point, is that we say everything to the extremes. It's the, as my friend Chad Dukes would say, it's the goat or trash era of sports media content. Either you're the greatest of all time or you suck. There's no room in between. There's somewhere between, there's this chasm between the season is over, they should just quit, and the Orioles are definitively going to win the World Series. Neither of which is true, and you fall somewhere between those things. The truth is, beforehand... While the Orioles were certainly closer than some teams to being a likely World Series winner, they weren't in the upper echelon of that group. So they sure as hell didn't get closer to they're going to definitively win the World Series when Felix Batista got hurt. So there's no argument that they didn't get closer to the other thing. Now, how close? It's impossible to define. But what I fear is that in our own attempts to pacify ourselves, to make ourselves feel better about the circumstances, we might diminish what it is that Felix Batista has really done this season. I had uh, some callers yesterday on the radio show who used terms like, well, all he does is get three outs. Somebody else can get those outs. That might make yourself feel better. These are the facts. Felix Batista, if you know, if the season ended today, would be by far the MVP of this baseball team. From start to now, there has not been a more consistent or more dominant player on this team. While there are technically two players who have a better war for the season, remember, those are everyday players. Felix Batista has posted roughly the same war as Adley Rutschman and Gunnar Henderson, despite playing in a half as many games. It's not close. Who has been the best player on this team, if you consider everyone, and then you add in the consistency. Now, at this point, 
if Felix Batista doesn't throw another pitch. I'll guess that Gunnar Henderson or Adley Rutschman or maybe even Kyle Bradish figures out a way to get into the MVP team MVP conversation. I'll even assume it. But without question, without question, Felix Batista has been team MVP to this point. And overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly, Griffin, you left your microphone on. You got to turn your microphone on when you off when you take a phone call. Um, overwhelmingly, what he's done stands out. Stands out even amongst the history of seasons that relief pitchers have put together. If you make the minimum 60 innings pitched in order to make the numbers work, and you have to create a number, and I just came up with that number because Felix Peace has passed the 60 inning mark. If you make the number 60 innings pitched as a minimum, no one. Sorry, I did that. I said the wrong thing. I got two two statistics conflated. Only four pitchers in the history of baseball have had better single season strikeout rates than what Felix Batista has done this year. In the history of baseball, four pitchers who have thrown a minimum of sixty innings in a season have had a better strikeout rate than Felix Batista's this year. Which isn't to say that he's been perfect or flawless or whatever you want to say or that he was going to be league MVP, humorously, ESPN Cy Young indicator, which they gotta they gotta work on. They gotta tinker it's, with. No, it's clearly correct. I mean they had Felix Batista not just number one, but number one by a long shot for who should be the Cy Young winner this year. I dove into the math of what they do the truth is the biggest flaws are pitcher wins and um, the bonus points they give for a team that's winning their division. But uh, even if you took yeah. those away from Felix Batista, considering he doesn't have as many wins as some of the other guys, he'd still be leading that metric, which is to suggest that perhaps maybe we should have been looking more into what Felix Batista was doing as far as the conversation about potentially being a Cy Young winner. We can try to make ourselves feel better by diminishing it or suggesting that someone else could do it, but it doesn't rewrite fact. What Felix Batista has done, both in the context of the rest of this team and the history of relief pitching, has been overwhelming and spectacular. And so to pretend... Again, just to make ourselves feel better, to pretend like there won't be significant impact from Felix Batista being sidelined is nonsense. The fact is, what was already an extraordinarily difficult path, and that's the third element of the conversation, just got wildly more difficult. The third element is, this is a team that had lar- largely been in this situation because of Felix Batista. As we talked about with Michael Bauman from Fangraphs last week, the Orioles have outperformed their Pythagorean model by eight wins. That's the based on everything that they've done as a team, run scored, situational, all of that, they would be expected to be about eight games worse than they currently are. The way that they've done that was by having the number one bullpen war in all of baseball. And to take nothing away from solid seasons that other guys have had in the bullpen, we all know why they have the number one war ba- bullpen war in all of baseball. Because of the guy that was pitching in the ninth inning. They're here, the one area where this team had a noteworthy advantage over everyone else. It's not a team of smoke and mirrors. It's not the 2012 Orioles who finished with a plus seven run differential for the year, and it was absurd the season that they put together. But 
the fact that they have the second best record in baseball and the seventh best run differential in all of baseball suggests that the Orioles always had an uphill battle to cl- or uphill climb to try to do this. It's treacherous now. None of which means you shouldn't watch the game tonight. Or we should just give up. Or that it's all over or anything along those lines. None of this means that it's impossible. It was pointed out to me, our, our, our buddy Paul Valios, the bat around, was very offended by everyone thinking that... the. You know, he wanted to remind you that Sean Doolittle was the closer for the Nationals in 2019, which is true. Koji Uehara was the Red Sox closer in 2013 after two other guys got hurt. But the these Orioles have not proven to be those teams. They didn't have Steven Strasburg and Max Scherzer in their prime, and Anthony Rendon and, Bryce and Juan Soto. Sorry, not one not Bryce Harper. No, he was not on that team. They didn't have David Ortiz and Dustin Pedroia and John Lester. And that's not to say that Adley Rutschman and Gunnar Henderson won't be those guys for the next few years to come. But you're asking a lot. The truth is that the Orioles, one of the things that in order for this to survive this, they're going to have to have fewer one-run games. That's going to have to be part of it. They're going to need a number of guys to step up, not just Yenier Cano, not just whoever moves into the primary setup role with Yenier Cano moving into a closer role, not just whoever else might be asked to close if they're not confident in Yenier Cano at a certain point, who, to be fair, has pitched well in August. And what happened yesterday definitely wasn't his fault. They need to score more runs. They need to be a better overall baseball team in order to make up for the loss of their best player. This is as significant. The, the way that we talked about Marlon Humphrey a couple weeks ago, like, hey, this is the player that they could second least afford to lose. The reality is that this year, Felix Batista is probably at least that. And you could debate the value of an everyday player versus the value of a closer, and we can have that conversation ad nauseum. I would certainly understand if your argument was Adley just because he's the catcher and because they don't have as many quality players that play the same position, you could debate Adley. Gunner might be their best player, but you could understand the argument that but you have a lot of infielders and you feel like you could get some production maybe out of other guys that would play and make up for it. That's how good Felix Batista has been. And we can't pretend like it's not the case. Now, as the point was made to me by a few folks this weekend, this team has also had their backs against the wall a number of times throughout the course of the year. They have come through quite well in a lot of those circumstances, given some of the difficulties they faced. Injuries to Cedric Mullins, injuries to Ryan Mountcastle. They've handled that. Starting pitching issues. Guys having to be bumped out of the rotation. They've handled that. The things that have been given to them, the Rays getting off to the best start in baseball history, they handled that. Adversity has not been an issue in general for this team. They've come through quite well. So I'm not saying it's impossible that they won't figure out a way to raise their level and raise their play. But I can't pretend like this isn't the most difficult test that they faced yet and that they weren't they weren't prepared as much As much as we can say we understand why the Orioles didn't make more aggressive moves at the deadline, we all believe they needed more arms even with a healthy Felix Batista. And one of the arguments 
that we don't make in that moment is the argument that you're probably not going to be able to stay healthy the entire way. So part of what you need is overwhelming depth. Even if you can argue that, hey, we might get John Means back, we might get Tyler Wells, but you can, you can argue those things. One of the reasons why good competitive teams try to load up isn't just because somebody is underperforming, it's because they want to prepare for future injuries as well. They want to create a best-case scenario where they have too many good players. But a worst-case scenario where if someone gets hurt before the season is over, they're prepared to handle that. Almost unanimously, we agreed that the Orioles needed to add another bullpen arm. They didn't. Now, they also pulled Jacob Webb off of waivers, and he's been productive. They did weeks earlier trade for Fujinami, who's been, hmm, I don't know, Mo in moments he looks helpful. Perhaps a, a path to the postseason roster is opening up again for Fujinami. We'll see. I mean, we got to figure out what D.L. Hall does in the coming weeks. If D.L. Hall looks like he did on Saturday, then he'll probably take a postseason roster spot. <sighs> they needed to make a trade for another leverage bullpen arm. And I get it. Like, my hopes of it being Josh Hader were dashed in the days leading up to the deadline because the Padres won some baseball games. Not that I know whether or not the Orioles would have been in the market for that anyway. The price was fairly steep. I mean, they paid, a, paid a, a high price for a mediocre starting pitcher that was a rental. And the conversation will go on eternally as to whether or not they should have paid a greater price or whether they made the right decision by not going all in on this season when the next couple of seasons are the better look at the window. no one to blame for Felix Batista getting hurt. But they didn't go out of their way in order to create a scenario where they had another truly high-leverage guy that they could have faith in in these situations. And we'll see how it plays out. I, I'm, not, I'm not panicking. Because part of this, too, is also the conversation that we've had all throughout the course of the year about whether or not them winning the World Series this year was even a reasonable or likely goal. Okay, I couldn't. If you're trying to show me something, it doesn't help to put the paper down on the table. Griffin's like, I got this message. It's over here. If you want to jump across the table, you can find out what it is. I'm not going to do that. I just didn't put on my jumping shoes today. So appreciate you holding But next time. So next time. Yeah, yeah. I might, okay, I might do that. Good. I might do that. I'm, I'm not going to commit to it just yet. Today's show brought to you by your local Toyota dealer, buyatoyota.com. The Toyota Tacoma comes in a range of models and trim lines, so you can choose the perfect Tacoma to reflect your unique personality and driving habits. Check out buyatoyota.com for deals on new Tacomas from your local Toyota dealer today. And also bear in mind, like I get this response, I, I'm not suggesting that suddenly this means their path to making the playoffs becomes impossible. My God. I mean... This is in the context of making a deep run in the playoffs. And that's what I keep coming back to. Like, it depends on what you think the goal is and what's reasonable for this season. And I've never thought that winning the World Series was reasonable, but at a point we argued, but it might be attainable. And the path to that, of that being attainable, feels not, I, again, I can't use the word impossible, but really unlikely at the moment. Joining us now, let's talk a little bit more about it. Of course, Exit 52 in Barstool Sports. He has still not paid off his debt from like five years ago, and we got to do something about that. He is our friend Eric R.D. He's back with us now here on the program. What's going on, brother? How are you? I don't remember like what bet we're talking about at this yeah, point. It was a, a preseason baseball selection. It involved a, pre a prison pizza that you were supposed to consume. Oh. And, uh, I'm yeah. very disappointed. Look, I, I'm going to I'm never going to let you off the hook about it. And I'm going mm -hmm. to, to force Griffin at some point to, like, drag you in here kicking and screaming. 
Um, but you know, so you said Forrest Griffin at first. I was like, wait, the UFC guy? Like, no, why? Yeah, Forrest Griffin. I don't Griffin. Need that. see. I don't know where Forrest Griffin is, but see if he can't chill out with that, man. Yeah, I bet you need a prison pizza. At Forrest. I'll Griffin eat the came. pizza. I don't need right. Forrest coming after me. Let, let's call. Let's pump the brakes. I didn't know it got that bad. I bet that would be the case. Um, hey, I need I need uh, to you to offer more terrible movie takes on Twitter because when I crush you over them, we get more engagement. I don't know how to explain it, but. I'm going to need that to be like a running bit. I need you to offer all of your worst movie takes so I can kill you about them moving forward. All right, please. I can start doing that again. I mean, I, the scene is not a good scene. It's not a funny scene. I get its character development, but I'm, I'm in the mood to laugh. You know, I'm not, I'm not in this. It's not Casablanca. I don't need the whole storyline. I, I mean, Just, for what it's worth, I I've said for a long time that most of Step Brothers is exactly like Casablanca. I'm glad you took that <laughs> out of my, yes, Casablanca that, not of our, every our scene in every movie can be the slapstick scene. Like there has to be an, a number of different types of scenes within even the funniest films of all time. <sighs> Derek stinks. It's not a funny scene. <laughs> That's what you got. We all agree that Derek stinks. That's the point. Yeah. They've got to tell you that Derek stinks. They have to explain that. And they did it in a clever way that everybody remembers to this day. And here's Eric over here. And I fast forward every time. Who are you? You fast forward? Yeah. On DVR or whatever, you know, it's on demand. Really? You don't really have the time to be doing that. (laughs) You're really going and grabbing your remote. Like, ah. The sweet child of mine. Yeah. I, I've never noticed that. I don't know if it was in the movie. I they, they can't say sweet child of mine at the end. I never noticed that until you shared it. They have to change the lyric to sweet love of mine. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. I that don't, makes sense now. I don't okay. know what that is. Like, how can they use the rest of the song, the song. and not that word? Like, I don't, I don't understand copyright at all because I'm an idiot. Like, I don't understand most things because I'm an idiot. But like that one in particular stands out to me. Like, what? Why? Why is yeah, that a thing? I've never noticed that either. But now that you mention it, it's one hundred percent the what they do. So I don't know. That that's strange. Right. We'll have to do some digging on that. That's what I had for you today. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate it. Nope, good thanks, talk. guys. Have a good one. Um, look, man, I'm trying to be as realistic about this as possible because it's what I do. Um, <laughs> as I said a million times, I don't think that Felix Batista's injury means that the the season's over. You stop watching the games. But I also think that we can't pretend like this isn't serious derailment for a team whose path to trying to win. I, like, I, do I think they can still win the division? Of course they do. Do I think they can still? All of those things. But their path to trying to do something of significance in the playoffs was always a little treacherous because they're an imperfect team. And mm-hmm. now it seems borderline impossible for me at this point to try to make up for it. Yeah, it, it, again, when I heard you talking about, you know, winning the World Series and all that, like I still I mean, I think at times the offense is a World Series. I think the offense is good enough to win a World Series. We've seen them just absolutely just play out of their mind. Um and then again, they kind of come back down to earth, but the big thing was always the bullpen, the bullpen, the bullpen, you know, the starters have have really pitched well the last couple of weeks, but again, we've always kind of circled the bullpen. And I think that's where a lot of people were frustrated at the deadline like again, you were saying where you know, you didn't go out and get, you got Fuji, but you could have got an, another arm or two, you know, I think which a lot of people wanted. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, can, are they, can they still win the division? A hundred percent. I still think they will win the division. Um, can they win a playoff series or two? I still think so. Absolutely. Like you said, this season is not over. I mean, Cano has looked much better as of what the last three or four In weeks August really been great. Yeah, and again, he he's not May Cano, but he you know I mean that was that was unbelievable. We, you know we'll never see that again probably, but he he started to look better again. The roller coaster that is Fuji, you know sometimes he's up, sometimes he's down. Who knows? Um, and again, it's not you don't like to bank on these guys, but it's like you know you have Tyler Wells who's going to be up probably within the next couple of days or weeks. You know DL Hall, it, you know was always going to come up and he looked great in his short appearance the other night, but it's like. None of those guys can step in and be Felix. Um, and I'm I'm also the 15 day IL thing to me. That's he's right, done for the year. Right, I, I'm right. At, and at least I'm assuming a decent chunk of next year, too. So like that's to me, this is more kind of it affects next year because like we had all talked about, like next year is the one where, again, if you want to start talking World Series, I think that's a realistic goal. You know, it, it would have been going into next season, that, depending on what they do in the offseason, stuff like that. But I'm with you. I mean. Season isn't over. Again, you, 42,000 at the ballpark Saturday night. They must have missed the memo that, you know, the season was over, like half of Twitter was saying. Um, 
but yeah, it, it's going to be a tough road. Again, you lose the best closer in baseball, arguably one of the best pitchers in baseball, ESPN, you know, take it for what it's worth, but they had him as their, you know, number one in the Cy Young weird chart thing. So um, yeah, it, it was a real kick in the stomach Friday night. Um, again, I was kind of hoping it was a back or an ankle or a knee. And then the second hides at arm discomfort, I just kind of had to sit down and, and yep. <laughs> try and regroup yep. while the big three was just blaring in my face for another hour and 45 <laughs> minutes. after the game. Um, all right. So let's cover a couple things here. One, to your point, uh, yes, the, the Cano, you, you hope that he steps up and you, you hope that you can get as much as you can out of him. And I'm even, look, I, I hope that DL Hall can be what we thought that DL Hall could be going into the season. And for some bizarro reason, the Orioles were – Hell bent on loading and deloading and loading and deloading. And I've, I'll never understand what the thought process was with DL Hall this year. I'll, mm. I'll die trying to figure out what the hell was going on there. So I hope that as most of us had accepted, hey, probably the best usage for DL Hall is leverage back end bullpen guy. I hope that's what he turns out to be. I can hope for all of those things. But what I really believe is that they're just gonna have to play fewer one run games. Like the the path to making up for the loss of Felix Batista is a little bit what happens in the bullpen, but to me it's far more they need to score some more runs. They, the starting pitching has to be more consistent. They've got to get more innings from the guy. Like I, I, Our buddy Ryan Ripken and I were going on about this yesterday. Like He was trying to say, hey, look, you know, in three out of his four starts, Ryan Flaherty, or sorry, not Ryan Flaherty, Jack Flaherty's given the team a chance to win. And I was like, I don't think that give the team a chance to win was what the Orioles needed in a starting pitcher at the deadline. I think they needed <laughs> someone that could step up a little bit and give more innings and do what Kyle Gibson did the other night, which was nice to see from him because he had been a mess for a few starts before that. Like That, to me, the path to them overcoming Batista – has a little bit to do with the guys that are the back end of the bullpen and way more to do with they need to be an overall better baseball team moving forward. Yeah, again, I mean, you you nailed it. Again, it, it's all kind of – it's like the trickle-down effect. Like, you know, if, if your starters go deeper, then, again, your bullpen's more rested and you'll have to worry about them and the wear and tear and blah, blah, blah. So, again, it's like the first, you know – half of the season it's like oh Felix they're using him so much and it's like yeah well they have to because every game is close in the ninth every single game and we I mean we talk about it on Twitter all the time like just one easy game that's all I want right. like a 13 to 1 win would would go a long way like especially again for these teams and we see them trying to rest these guys and you know he had try and Hyde had tried to kind of skirt around using Cano and 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 Bautista and again what, what was it the what game was it when he he took him out after the ninth um, oh, last week, yes. Was it the yeah, Blue Jays? Yeah, was it the, correct, was the, the Blue first Jays game? game. Yep. Mm -hmm. It was like forever ago. Yeah, but, right. um, well. Yeah, so, you know, it, it's, I don't know. Again, it, it all it's all a trickle-down effect. And, yeah, you know, getting a guy who, who and again, maybe, was it Dylan Cease? Was it, was it Justin Verlander? Maybe, you know, but it's like getting those guys who you hand them the ball and you know they're going seven minimum, absolute minimum. And then, again, then you're playing a two-inning game with the bullpen. So yeah, it's 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 tough, but like like you said, they do just have to play better. Like like put these put together these complete games. We've seen it a bunch of times where they score. I mean, it was the the game the other night. They score two in the first against the Rockies, and then they don't have a hit for like the next six innings. And it's like, it's yes, the the, the innings with the crooked numbers are nice, but it's like you can spread out this offense. You have to because again, it, it it's I think at times it's a World Series winning offense, but mm -hmm. at times they just fall asleep and. And then you look up and Ty Black or Ty Block is throwing, you know, six six strikeouts in, in six innings or whatever when he had like nineteen strikeouts in forty one innings coming into the game. So I mean, no, I don't it's... if you didn't see that coming from a mile away, right. I don't I don't of, know. Of what course, to tell you. yes, of course. The guy that it was absolutely like I swear to God going into the weekend, I forgot that Ty Block existed. Like I, I was... saw I saw him on Twitter last week. Somebody mentioned him, like, oh, how well he was doing. And I looked him up, and I was like, that's right, he did pitch. And then in the back of my mind, I thought, all right, immaculate grid guy. Right, but, right. again, it's like, yeah, I think – I forget who tweeted out yesterday, Nathan Ruiz or somebody, but he said he had the highest Orioles starter ERA with a minimum of five starts in his career. Yeah, but other so. than that, but other than that, right, like, what a guy. Yeah, that, of course, would be the guy that you could not get a hit off of for three innings and then – couldn't yeah. get out in 2019. And, right. And, to, and to your point, then the, the problem was compounded by you get the bases loaded and nobody out and you don't mm -hmm. score a run, which is just, you it, know, how does that happen? And, and you know me, I mean, I don't like, I'm not a big point the finger guy really, but like Adley, I think has to get a better read on that ball at second. I know it's a weird play and a weird angle, but I, somebody was, somebody on Twitter was like the third base goes hatched has to be yelling at him to get there. 
It's like, I get that, but it's also, again, like that's a read a player has to make. It's a tough play. You know, it's kind of behind him, so he's looking around. But mm-hmm. that, and then again, obviously, you had the, the Hayes first pitch ground into double play, and, and it kind of just all fell apart there. But yeah, that was, um, yep. they got to be able to do damage there. Yep. It's, it's one of those things. Eric Arditi is with us, Barstool Sports, and of course, Exit 52, where you find him. Eric, I, it's interesting you bring this up, the idea that like as, as much of it is the ramification on this season, that the ramification for next year could be just as significant when it comes to Felix Batista. And in a way, it, it opens up sort of like a competition for these guys internally for these roles for next year. And I think it all is then further compounded by the fact that like it'd be easy for somebody to say, well, you've got to go out, you've got to spend money on an on a arm. And I think we're all still sitting here saying to ourselves, Hey, they are going to spend money on something, right? Like, right? And that's where all of the other stuff that we've been dealing with for the last couple of weeks now meets this impact on the field, which is, do we have faith that the Orioles are willing to do what's necessary in order to make up for the loss of a Felix Batista? Yeah, it's it, that. that's going to be the whole thing. I mean, you know, liftoff, you know, we went through that a year and a half ago or a year and, you know, a year and two months or whatever mm-hmm. it was, and then nothing really happened. And again, to... And I think now it's becoming more and more clear that that did not fall on Mike Elias. I think it's hard to spend other people's money, especially when they're, you know, mouthing off to the New York Post or New York Times or whatever it was every other week and and, and doing a lot of, you know, just, just getting into it. Again, I mean, no, it's not Elias's money. He's trying to spend John Angelos and, and the family's money. And, and he may have gone to them and said last year, you know, hey, we need to do this. And they said, no, we're not we're not going to pay for that. Hopefully this year is different, you know. A Josh Hader, who's a free agent, I believe. I mean, you know, put the welcome home banners up. It'd be you really know, great, would be wouldn't an, it? Wouldn't that, that be would just be an awesome thing? Amazing. If that were is it going to happen? Don't I don't know. So. Again, I mean, if you throw Hader is the first name that jumped into my mind, just because again, the Orioles are going to have a need a closer, probably. Mm-hmm. You know, a, a back end bullpen guy, and that's also a guy who would be awesome. I mean, if you could get like a seven, eight, nine of Cano next year, Cano while Bautista's out. Cano in the eighth, you know, um, Hader in the ninth. And then when Felix eventually comes back, which is hopefully again, a couple months, I mean, I'm not, I'm not thinking he, he may not pitch at all next year. That's Possibly, just me. Yeah. Um, him in the ninth, Hader in the eighth. And then, you know, Cano in the seventh. I mean, that's the 2014 kind of bullpen all over again, you would hope, but yeah, it's, it's, you know, this is the year again, I'm hoping winter meetings, you know, you can make trades, you can sign, you know, these free agents. You have to make a signing now. You have to. I think we, again, we see how good this team is without, with the only big acquisitions they made in the offseason were Gibson and Frazier. Like, you know, if they go out and they get some legit guys, I don't see why a World Series, like, is not, you know, it shouldn't be out of the question for next year. So, yeah, it's, this all falls on Johnny Boy and, and you know, what he lets Uncle Mike do and, and, and just, just, again, Take your hands off. Like, let him go. Like, let him control the baseball team, John. Like, nobody's worried expecting about your it, concerts yeah. and yeah, stuff no, later. Nobody's expecting it to be $300 million in payroll that's no, added. Like, no. nobody thinks that's the case. But, like, this got to be – if you can't add something, then the points that everybody's making about then you probably can't own the baseball team, that's realistic. It's, if if you can't, valid. If you can't capitalize on this moment and say, we need to add some payroll to try to take advantage of it, and we can get into the bigger there's there's bigger issues afoot there's the can you ever sign your own players are you just announcing loudly to everybody that you'll never do that because that becomes problematic and that would also go into that first argument that you just can't own a baseball team but it's a conversation mm-hmm. for a different day all right uh two things before uh we wrap up one we we assume that you know the pitcher that's going to be added will be one of means or wells with the other one you know being added shortly thereafter at, at the cost of somebody currently on the team on the flip side, who's the position player that you would be adding to the roster once we get to uh, Friday? I I mean, it's probably – it's got to be a toss-up, I think, between Kowser and Kerstad. I think, you know, obviously we've seen Kowser come up. Um, he struggled at the plate. I don't think that's – you know, everybody knows that. Um, then, of course, I think – I haven't checked his numbers lately, but I know when, once he went back down to Norfolk, he was he, he was kind of raking – um, hit a home run, I think, on the first pitch he saw or whatever. But Kerstad, I know, has kind of slowed down the last couple of weeks from what I had read. So he was always a fun name to, to, again, kind of toss around. I would love to see him up here. I just don't know, again, the roster crunch. Like, I don't know, you know, do you send McKenna down and bring up one of those guys? Obviously, Aaron Hicks is still on the IL. Right. Um, I don't know what they do with him when he, you know, when he comes back. Maybe I, I 
you need that veteran who's kind of been there before. Um, I don't know. I, I would think it's got to be between those two, and maybe you can throw in like a Joey. Or I don't see. I don't. I want to say Ortiz, but I don't think there's really any room to fit him because I think now we kind of see with with Mateo like. He won them a couple games last week with, I mean, you know, the you saw the play in Oakland, the the with the the inside the Parker, and he's he's in this 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 role now where it's like if he can come in as a late inning, you know, Terrence Gore, Gerard Dyson kind of guy, and 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 you know, pinch run and then play defense and stuff like that. I think that's fine, but you can't have him starting. I think you know in a full playoff series. So I don't know if Ortiz, if there is room, it's got to be one of the outfielders. It's got to be Kerstad or Kowser. Um I, I I don't know. I don't know which one again, maybe, maybe Kowser because he's already on the 40 man and, and he's been up here, but right. I, I don't know. I, it's gotta be between one of those two. To so your, to I'm your fine point, with either one. To your point about Hicks, it would not surprise me at all for them to just say like, if whenever he's ready to return, that's, a, that's our guy. And we'll just leave McKenna here. And yep. like, that's, it's going to infuriate a number of four heels fans, but it, it just can't possibly surprise me. Um, and then finally, you know, I'm glad that our we're not our show's probably not important enough for that guy that rates rooms on uh, on Twitter to be looking at it because you got a really boring background there, bro. What's going rates on? Rates rooms. You haven't seen the room raider like that? No. This was a thing that popped up during the pandemic where like everybody was doing their hits from like their office or whatever. Yeah. There was a very popular Twitter account that started rating everyone's backgrounds on their zooms, and <laughs> like was you know would give them scores. And it became yeah. extraordinarily popular. And if that guy was watching you, they'd say, "What the? What, I mean, we need we need like some bookshelf. You're you're very not. Well, I got like, I where, got. You, where's your you whole Mel Kuyper set up, man? Like we need Wait. the whole. I got the snake cage back there. Ah, got, all right. Can't see where is it? There's some Orioles Hall of Famers back there. We're in the guest bedroom, so again, it's all not right. my it's not an ideal setup, but. All right. Um, I'll bring the snake out if you want. I would actually. Oh, you know, we're actually we gotta, we gotta get another stupid guest on. Uh, <laughs> I remember when I called you an f face for no reason last week. That was fun. I want to yeah. do that more. I need more. Please, please give we me. We can more. chop. You know, you know, I'm never shy about mixing it up on Twitter. That's what I'll, I'm saying. I'll, I'll get into the mud. But I need material for it. I need you to like throw out another awful take so that I can go back and forth about it. And like, 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 uh, I need you to say something on Twitter today, like. The only appropriate way to eat a crab cake is on a sandwich, and then I can just absolutely murder and devour you over that. Can you do that for me? I, I could come up with some good ones. Uh, I was gonna say a movie one. I thought Social Network was awful. Um, I watched that once and never again. I, it's definitely I not. It, you're wrong that it's awful, but I don't feel strongly enough about it that I would want to fight you about it. Like I, I do like the fact that you're wrong because it's not awful. It's a yeah, fine. It's fine. What's awful? I didn't yeah, like it. Fine. I was just like, it's, it's I know how it ends. I, <laughs> Well, I'm okay with us not glorifying Mark Zuckerberg in any. I was gonna say, are you are you bootlegging for Zuckerberg? I'm I'm good on that part. Like whenever we make a movie about somebody like that, I'm just like, yeah, they're probably creeps. But like, you want me to you want me to go to war for the Winklevoss twins? You want those to be the heroes of the story? Because that ain't happening either, guy. Like none of these people are likable. Uh, what Justin Timberlake sh- playing Sean Parker, the guy that shut down. Like you, you want me to re- the the Napster guys, the guy that I'm supposed to look at as the hero, the guy yeah, whose right. contribution was to drop the from the name. You know, it's cool. Just Facebook. Like, no, nah, man, I ain't doing that. That ain't happening. He, Timberlake was perfect for that. I love, I love Timberlake. He did, he did handle that. He's well. great. Alpha Dog, one of my Alpha Dogs. One Alpha of my Dog was movies. a really good movie too. Awesome. Uh, I even love the with the the stupid Mila, Mila Kunis movie. What's the, I don't even remember which one it is. Uh, Just friends, friends with benefits. Or friends or with, yeah, I never remember if it's friends with benefits or no strings attached. I'll never in my life remember which one it is. Same exact thing. It's Spider Man meme. Just Correct. All exactly. Right. Except one of them was very good, and the Ashton Kutcher one stunk. Like that's the Justin Timberlake one. Good film. Ashton Kutcher one terrible. Who was the one in the Ashton Kutcher video? Who was the girl? Natalie Portman, right? Wasn't it? Wasn't it Natalie? Portman? I'd go. I'd go Mila over her. But again, I'm not. I'm of not, course you would. We're not. Cra- I'm not crapping on Portland. Or well, Portland. no, nobody's saying anything negative about N- Natalie. No, yeah. Somebody. But this is like when somebody complains to me about the, the. Oh, I think I said this to you guys the night of the draft. When somebody whines about, oh, I see the state flag everywhere. I'm like, I saw Mila Kunis everywhere for six years of my life, and you know what? I never complained about seeing seeing Mila Kunis. I yeah, asked for more. Yeah. God, if something. Never mind. There's a conversation. I'm getting worked up now. All right. Uh, exit 52 uh, at EDD22 on Twitter. What else can I plug for you, pal? Um, I don't know. I got nothing. I got nothing going on right now. All right. I love You're a boring con. I love you. You, you, are, you are still an F face, but I love you. All right. I'll, I'll stew on, some, um, on some, some takes. I'm on a plane to San Diego on Friday, so that'll give me plenty of time. What are you, to... what are you going to San Diego for? I'm in a wedding. 
So oh, that's a hell of a place to be going for a wedding. That worked out nice, man. That's yeah. great. It'll be a good time. So All I'll right. freak out on the plane. Oh, I forgot. Yeah, you're that guy. I forgot about it. I got to see if I can bring my edibles on a plane. Can I don't you, know. Yeah, can you bring your own chicken nuggets on the plane too? Let's I see. hope so. Next time, remind me to tell you about the conversation I had with Adam about oysters and chicken tenders. Oh, I golf. think I saw something about that. That's yeah. I'm glad. I'm glad he he took that out on you. I'm glad he did that. Yeah. Somebody needed to. All right, buddy. Love you. Let's talk soon. Thank you, guys. See you, pal. That's Eric Arditi with us here on GCR. Appreciate him doing that. All right. Um, no break. Yeah, we just got to keep rolling along, don't we? Let's do that. That's fine. Matt Torper got in. He said, um, Orioles can, will make the playoffs. They can still win the division. And if they do, Batista will play a huge part in getting them there. Everything beyond that was always going to be a roll of the dice anyway. That's fair. That's fair. Honestly, I'm much more worried about the implications of the Batista injury on next season and beyond than the rest of this one. He's already offered them tremendous value and almost single-handedly clinched them the playoffs in August. If they're facing a full a full 2024 season without him, that's where it gets truly scary. Also, whether he needs Tommy John or not, you're going to wonder if he's ever going to be the same when he comes back. That is fair. All of those things are fair. You know, I hate to say it, but they're fair. All right. Um, I wanted to do this last week after we saw the interview in the New York Times because every time I've ever talked to our next guest, he's always been very wary. Like when we were like, hey, we're on board with the rebuild. He's like, yeah, okay, but just be wary. Sometimes they call it a rebuild when what they're really saying is just we want to be cheap. And so every time a story about a misstep within the leadership of the Baltimore Orioles comes up, I think about this man. He is, of course, part of uh, Dan Lebitard's crew and was the president of the Marlins. He is David Sampson, and he's back with us now here on GCR. David, it's Glenn in Baltimore. It's always good to catch up. Thank you for taking the time for us this morning. Absolutely. How are you? I'm all right. Uh, you know, it, like we're in this really tough spot in Baltimore where the baseball, beside from Felix Batista getting hurt, the baseball has been wonderful. But then there's been all of this other stuff that we've been dealing with again over the course of the last month. And seemingly every time we see a story nationally, it's not about how exciting the baseball is. It's about um, a misstep from the leadership of the team. What have you like? What have you been thinking about as you've been watching this season unfold for the Baltimore Orioles? I've been spending so much time trying to convince people that they should be focused on the field because it would be my dream to have such a good team and not have people thinking about all the bad things that were happening off the field. And I can't believe ownership is bringing up anything off the field right now because there's plenty of time for that. It's just. David, you still there? Yes. Oh, sorry. We lost you for a second. No, I, I look, I trust me. I, I think it's insane to be just, you're, the call is coming from inside the house. You're shooting yourself in the foot. You, you don't need to be doing this type of stuff. I, and I feel like the, the, the real fear is, for a lot of, of Orioles fans, you can separate and say, okay, you know, let's, we're not going to worry too much about that. The, you know, Kevin Brown's back, and let's just not think too much about the other stuff. And the baseball team's here. But then you run into the things like having conversations about, hey, what could they add this offseason in order to try to make sure that they make the jump to winning a World Series next year, and you find yourself saying, but are they going to add anything because is ownership just outright telling us they're not going to choose to spend any money on any baseball players, and that's the way that it's going to be, which then lessens the experience of enjoying the baseball part of things. So that's where I would disagree, and you should never let anything lessen the enjoyment of what you're going through right now because next year it could be a step backwards. Next year, it may not go as well. Next year, you could be the Padres or the Mets. So I would encourage you to live in this moment because it's very hard to schedule greatness. I appreciate that thought process, David. I, I'm sure you understand why, given our history in Baltimore, it's a little bit difficult to block out everything else. Of course I do. And I, I was in a community like that in Miami. Yeah. yeah. So I get it. But I promise you, you're, it's not going to get you anywhere. Complaining will not get Angelos to sign players. Being angry will get him to sell the team. 
It's not going to get a new stadium or renovations done. Being upset, and I'm just telling you from experience, from a fan standpoint, being upset and not enjoying the on-field success, it's just not a trade worth making. He is David Sampson, of course, former Marlins team president, now a CBS Sports HQ and the Nothing Personal with David Sampson podcast. All right, so so I can let me let me say tell you I'll agree I'll agree with what you're saying it's not worth it, but the other issues are still real. So if we did separate those two things and say hey there's a fun baseball team to watch, but yet there's also these other things that we're concerned about with the health of the baseball team. If I just simply ask David, do you feel like the Orioles are set to be contenders for the next three to four years? How would you respond to that? <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear because you. Because this is important. Here's the problem. You're asking about your window right now. Mm -hmm. And what John did is say that there's no way that everyone can be an Oreo long term. And he's totally right. It's happening in Toronto. They can't keep all their position players long term. Turnover is going to happen. So what you need to count on are the baseball people to choose correctly and extend the young guys who are actually going to outperform their contract and let the others go year to year and continue on. So you're not going to have the same team four years from now that you have now, but the competitive window with these young players, it will still be open. So I, I asked that because before the season, the, the word was we're going to be the next Tampa, right? Which was odd for us in Baltimore, David, because we thought – that Mike Elias was here and that the plan was to try to follow the Houston path and become the next Astros. And we know that the Astros ultimately got to a place where they said, okay, we're here, we're going to spend some money to make up the difference. Did you feel like when John Angelo said, we want to be the next Tampa, it was just his way of saying that we're going to be constantly moving players. We're just going to, we're going to see when they have the most value and we'll move them at that point. And we will rarely be spending money and trading, you know, and, and, and keeping these guys around long term. It's hard to argue with the success of Tampa. In owners' meetings, everyone would look at the Tampa table and say, I want to be them. I want to spend as little money as possible and win as many games as I can and compete in the playoffs and try to win a World Series. So if your front office – I was never smart enough to be Tampa. But if your front office is smart enough to be Tampa, there are way worse teams you could be, like – the Mets right. or the Padres. Right. Is, is there anything to be said for the difficulty of, like, for as much as the Rays have been competitive every year, and I know that they have far bigger problems, the, the stadium itself, the location of the stadium, but do you feel like it makes it more difficult for a community to embrace players, embrace the team, when they are, they are worried about whether or not that player is going to be there two years from now? That is something I've tried to solve for 20 years trying to promote the name on the front of the uniform instead of the back mm -hmm. and understanding that even in the dynasties, let's talk about the Astros. They have a core of players who have been there, but how many players have been there since 17? No, it's for Correa, Springer, you know, they Lance, right. Gone. Yep. <clears throat> the World Series MVP replaced Carlos Correa, and people say the Astros keep everybody the case no it's fair i mean it's it's extraordinarily fair and to say like this is yeah. this is that sometimes this is just the way that it goes and they made a decision and it appears to be working out quite well for them the decision that they made to move on from someone and they continue to be in position every year is it however is that easier to do when the belief is that you're willing to make up the difference like they're the team that's willing to go make a trade for a justin verlander we just don't know that the orioles are willing to fill in the gaps the same way? It's a great question. So now you're talking about revenue for the team. Mm -hmm. And Houston has more revenue than Baltimore. Right. And so you have to look at what's happening with Masson. You have to look at what's happening with the local revenue in Baltimore. And you have to look at what's happening with the Angelos family. And you have to think about whether they're putting – themselves and their team up for sale there's been so many off-field issues yep that they that they need to figure that out first what their plan is for themselves 
before they are going to be able to talk about what the plan is for the team. I want to pose a question, David, that was brought up. Uh, our friend Nathan Ruiz, uh, Orioles writer for the Baltimore Sun, wrote a column about uh, that sort of suggested that John Angelo should just stop talking. And I have a, a strange yeah. response to that because I, I feel like in a perfect world, yeah. we want to hear from the guy that's running the team. We want to hear from those people what the plan is and what they're doing. And that's the type of stuff that a fan base should like. But obviously – Every time he's talked this year, it has kind of gone south. So uh, where would you be between the problem is that he's talking versus the problem is what he's saying, and maybe he needs to work with somebody on how he messages things? Well, clearly he needs some PR help. Uh, my view is that you need someone in the organization who is going to be the public-facing person. Mm -hmm. Our owner rarely spoke to the press. I was the one, and that is both good and bad when you're the public face of a franchise. It doesn't make you very popular always because you have to deliver bad news and good news. And for John, he just has not been able to properly message what he's saying about small revenue teams and the issue in baseball. He is exactly correct. That is a major issue in baseball right now when you can have the Mets on one end and the A's on the other. The problem is there was no reason to say it when he did. Right. None. Right. And that hurt the message. Yep. Well, and it, and it, 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 you can't win on those things. Like, you can't win the, we don't have as much money as someone else. Because it's not, it's not my money. It's not Dave and, and Dundalk's money. They're just not concerned about where you are financially. They're concerned about whether or not the baseball team's going to win. And, like, you, you can never win with the fan base talking about finances it's just nobody nobody is ever going to feel bad for you when they're paying you know 16 dollars to try to get a hamburger at a restaurant on tuesday night there's no doubt and i don't know why john offered to open the books yeah uh that was a, that was a misstep if you, whatever you're going to say you better back it up again the distraction was not needed it reminds me of florida i don't know if you remember many years ago 1997 during the season, Wayne Huizinga was the owner, and he said, if we don't get a new stadium, I'm trading everybody. Right. And that was in the middle of their season mm -hmm. where they won the World Series, and then he traded everybody. Right. And he Correct. said, I told you so. Correct. And that was the first Correct. ever fire sale in Miami. It had nothing to do with me. I was not there at the time. And that's a strategy that's used in order to get public money. And it backfired on Wayne Heisinga, but it was still a strategy. I'm not sure what John's strategy was in saying the things he said. Well, I mean, he is clearly looking for more money. He already got $600 million, and apparently that's not enough. He's looking for $300 million more um, for upgrades around the facility. And, again, even some of his points about upgrading the area around Camden Yards, they have merit. Like, they do. I I'm listening to him, but he's not presenting the, the private part of the public-private partnership well. He's not saying, here's what we're going to do to prove that this is a partnership. It just seems like I want money, and that's the difficult part about this. Let me, let me ask one more thing of you, David, before I let you go. The, there, are, there are Orioles fans who say, I feel like the commissioner should step in. And every time someone says that, I say, you don't want that. That's not how sports should work. As frustrated as we are, the concept is still supposed to be that there are 30 individual entities competing against each other and that there isn't supposed to be someone who steps in and say, here's how you can run your business. A am I correct in saying we don't want a world in which even when ownership gets frustrating, that we allow commissioners to just step in and try to, to do things to break it up? The commissioner steps in when you've got a Donald Sterling or when you've got uh – uh, Robert Sarver, you, they don't step in for incompetence. They step in for culpability and for racism and misogyny and those issues. Uh, so this is not a situation like with Masson. The Orioles have been fighting with the Nationals for, what is it, 18 years already. And the commissioner, that's not their role. So I would not expect that the commissioner steps in when owners step uh, on their own feet as they're trying to publicly message. Yeah, that's just not the way that it works. All right, David P. Sampson on Twitter. Of course, David Sampson podcast for nothing personal. 
Uh, is there anything else that I can plug for you, man? No, I appreciate the way, and I, I'm rooting for you guys. Man, I, great I, story. It, it, really, it really would be nice if all we could talk about was how exciting baseball was in Baltimore because, boy, there was, there's a lot of excitement here. David, really appreciate it, man. Thanks for hopping on with us this morning. Have a great day. You as well. It's David Sampson uh, with us here on GCR. As um, I, I appreciate what he's saying. Don't think about it. I appreciate that. Just think about the baseball part. It's just not that easy. Like, and, and, he under, and as he said, he understands that. You were trying to do everything in our power to just look at this and not look at that. But as we just talked about with Eric, now you, know, you worry about Felix Batista being out for next year, and the first thing you say is, well, maybe they could go out and get a Josh Hader. And then the next thing you say is, well, that would require them going out and getting someone. And are we confident that they're ever going to do that? And that's where these two things butt heads. Our ability to just block it out and think about baseball but heads, butts heads with the fact that we have concerns about the leadership of the franchise. All right, uh, when we come back in, Jeremy Kahn's going to join us next. We will chat with him about whatever Jeremy Kahn wants to chat about. I, d- I don't know. We'll, we'll figure it out. It'll be probably a lot more of this. I, I don't know. We'll talk about it with Jeremy Kahn when we come back in. Glenn Clark Radio. You feel that? That's the sound of football coming back. And now's the time to place your preseason bets with Superbook Sports. Superbook is the most trusted name in Vegas. And now you can use my promo code, GlennClark23, to score up to $250 with their first bet bonus. Win or lose, they'll match your first bet up to $250 with the promo code GlennClark23. All one word, no spaces, two N's in Glenn. Don't miss out this football season. Win some money with Superbook Sports. Sports and that promo code Glenn Clark 23. Visit superbook.com for terms and conditions. Gambling problem? Call 1 800 Gambler. It's another exciting weekend of affordable family fun at Prince George's Stadium with the Bowie Bay Sox. Last weekend of the regular season kicks off on Friday the 8th with Adley Rutschman Night. Mystery Adley Rutschman giveaway items for the first 750 fans. Fireworks on Saturday with the return of our 1K beer run. See how fast you can complete the race while getting three beers down. And our Birdland celebration on Sunday. Free autograph items for the first 1,000 fans. Get your tickets now by calling 301-805-6000 or anytime online at BaySox.com. The Bowie Bay Sox. Let us be your nine-inning vacation. I'm Michael Jan Grandy, president President of AJ Michaels, your carrier energy expert for 44 years. Save money, energy, and make your home more comfortable and virus free. Find us at AJMichaels.com. That's AJMichaels.com. The Maryland Five Star returns to iconic Fair Hill October 19th to 22nd, marking the next chapter in Maryland's equestrian tradition. Best described as the triathlon of horse eventing, you won't want to miss this thrilling sport. Enjoy a fall festival with local fair, retail vendors, and tons of family fun. Come for the event and stay for the experience in Cecil County, home to the Chesapeake Bay waterfront with vibrant small towns and accommodations to suit every desire. It's the place to be in October. Visit Maryland5star.us for tickets. Hey, Birdland. A new alternative payment method is available at Oreo Park at Camden Yards for the 2023 season. O's Pay is a quick, convenient, and rewarding option to make payments at concessions and retail locations throughout the ballpark. Use O's Pay to unlock rewards, special offers, and unique experiences. And with secure, contactless payment, you'll get back to your seats faster. Get started in the MLB Ballpark app or learn more at Orioles.com slash O's Pay. That's Orioles.com slash O's Pay. That first sip. That first bite. Mm. Start your day off right with a delicious breakfast at Royal Farms. Choose from a fantastic selection of fresh Royal Farms breakfast sandwiches. And top it off with a rich, hot cup of the freshest coffee in the world. At Royal Farms, breakfast is available day and night. It's the freshest breakfast in the world. Real fresh, real fast. Royal Farms. It's a Maryland thing you wouldn't understand. Where the waves meet the shore, you will find Dorchester County. Hi, this is Jimmy Charles. When I think of Maryland, I think Dorchester County on the eastern shore where it's open for making memories. Dorchester County, it's a Maryland thing. For more info, visit www.visitdorchester.org. It's a Maryland thing. Yeah. 
America's biggest bike race returns to Maryland Sunday, September 3rd as 120 of the world's best cyclists race the Maryland Cycling Classic presented by United Healthcare. Come enjoy the free fan zones and festival with interactives, food, and drink beginning at noon. Then see the exciting race conclusion from 3 to 5 p.m. in the Inner Harbor. Come be loud, be proud, and let the world hear you. For more information, go to MarylandCyclingClassic.us. Whether your focus is luxury and comfort, convenience and technologically advanced connectivity, or sporty performance and aggressive styling, we've got the perfect Highlander for you. Check out buyatoyota.com for deals on new Highlanders from your local Toyota dealer today. If you miss anything on the show, don't forget that you can watch full episodes at youtube.com slash pressbox online, and you can download podcasts on Apple, iTunes, Amazon, and Grindr. Wait, did I say Grindr? I don't think that you would find it on Grinder. Not that I know it's on Grinder or anything. I swear. On second thought, you know what? I don't care what you think. Here's Glenn. Into hour number two of GCR today. Coming up a little bit later on this hour, we'll catch up with uh, Gary Renicky. Continue our celebration of the 40th anniversary of the 1983 World Series champion Baltimore Orioles. Uh, Griffin, you want to remind everybody what's going on at Live Casino and Hotel real quick? Uh, of course I do. I want to tell you about the new member program. Mm-hmm. We're something all going about on with your mic cord. I don't know what happened there. Or something happened when you touched that button. Yeah, we should have our headphones on because... Go ahead, the try new, it again. The new... Yeah, there's something going on there. Don't know what happened. Something happened. And it's happened right as you turned it on, oddly. Don't know what that is. Don't love it. We'll have to get that fixed. How do I, how do oh, I sound that's, now? That's good now. Okay, don't know right. what it was. All right. Uh, yeah, well, I want to tell you about the new member program over at Live Casino. Uh, we're all about more yes. Sign up for Live Casino and Hotel Maryland Rewards today and earn up to $50. Take a spin with the free slot play or join the action with the rec bet or indulge in your favorite dining experience with comps. All new members will receive a free tote bag as well. So for more info, go to maryland.livecasinohotel.com, maryland.livecasinohotel.com. Add Arundel Mills, must be 21. Please play responsibly for help. Visit mdgamblinghelp.org or call 1-800-GAMBLER. All right, joining us now because we'll never tell him what time and he just has to block out the entire hour for us. He is our friend Jeremy Kahn from 105.7 The Fan, and he's back with us on GCR. Jeremy, appreciate you continuing to prioritize us over everything else in your life. I think this has been – I think this one's my fault, though, because I had something scheduled uh, at 11 that got moved to 11.30, so it it, – Kind of ruined everything. So this oh, is all right, all right. You know what? Then I don't apologize for anything, and you're an a hole. And now we got to work around take you. What kind of diva yeah, are you that we have to work around you, man? What's that all about? Yikes! Like, I, uh, yeah, what a weekend, though. I watched telemarketers, by the way. Um, did you like it? I I did like it. It was like it was weird for me because what I expected it to be, like I, I guess I, I I didn't think about it enough. When I started watching, I was like, oh, this is just a a total mockumentary. This is just going to be slapstick humor. And then, like you, you realize it's way more serious than that. Yeah. Like it's a way more critical issue that we're dealing with. And while there is a lot of humor involved, um, it, it's sort of right on that line between mockumentary and like you know investigative sort of situation. Um, it did get me thinking about, and I talked to Griffin about the fact that I once had a telemarketing job uh, when I was in high school. It was one of the best jobs I ever had. And then I started thinking about. What is the job that you had in your life that was really a hustle? Like that you were getting way more out of it than they were and you really wish that it could have continued for forever? Um, well, I guess – so I did one thing where I was interviewing athletes, uh, a bunch of different athletes on a telephone service that was based out of Iowa – and it turned out like it was a scam against the phone company. Wait, 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 wait. What? Yeah. What? Yeah. So I was, I got hired by a company to interview athletes and it was supposed, this was like before podcasting was even a big thing. So like if you were, uh, uh, Rocket Ismail was one of the guys. So okay. I would interview Rocket Ismail. I would upload the audio and then you would call in on your phone. And you would listen to the interview or you could play it through your speaker, whatever, if you had a what? USB. You know, yeah. Okay. So I was doing that, and I was getting paid a lot of money, and but it turned out that the phone companies were getting scammed through some long distance thing, and that's how the company made money. I didn't know it. I just got asked to interview guys, and that's what I was doing. So Man. I didn't get any trouble or anything because I didn't know what was going on. But that is yeah, a good a one. Weird one. That is a really good one, man. <laughs> like that. I'm is... getting paid like fifteen hundred bucks a month, and you know, in, in our line oh, of work, yeah. to 
to just interview like a 10 minute interview with like four or five different athletes a week. And I'm like, okay, sure. Yeah. Well, my God is what I wouldn't have given for a gig like that. I have, um, w- when I started at Sirius XM, I had one job and then one day they came up to me and they said, Hey, how about instead of being involved with the uh, daily production, you instead become the voice of the preview channel. And I was like, well, what does that mean? They were like, well, all you got to do is go record, you know, like write a script that previews all of the games that were airing on a certain day, then go record it, and then edit three versions of it. So, like, one airs starting at at midnight the night before. Then you cut out anything, like all the soccer matches and stuff that happened, and you got one that starts at noon, and then one starts at six. Like, you, you just basically have to record one thing and then edit it two more times. And they, like, paid me as if I was doing 24 hours worth of work for something that really took me like about an hour and a half to do. And then they were like, oh, by the way, you don't have to come to D.C. to do it either. You can just do it from Baltimore. And I was like, what? <laughs> like, what is the catch here? What am I missing? And I just tried to That's- shut up about it. Like, I just hope that no one ever found out what I was doing because I was like, this is ridiculous. This is the easiest job. That sounds job. amazing. Right? It's incredible. Yeah. I don't. I didn't have to talk to another human being. All I had to do was like, and coming up tonight on Sirius XM or Sirius 24 XM 86, the White Sox take on the Orioles. Gavin Sheets returns to Baltimore. Make sure you tuned in. First pitch, 705. Like, that was it. <laughs> and I just had to do that for every game, every game and every sport. And it was fine, right? I didn't have to talk to anybody. I didn't have to go anywhere. I just had to send someone an email. Hey, Thursday is ready. Can you upload it for me? And email it to them. And that was it. And then I was done. All good. I could just walk around with my – and so finally I get a phone call like on New Year's Day the following year. They're like, uh, hey, they've realized we can't really put this budget towards the preview channel anymore. And I remember when they called, <laughs> my immediate response was, yes, that checks out. <laughs> like, that, yeah. sounds, that sounds right, if I'm being honest with you. And the guy was you really – You're making a sound decision. Here. Right. I don't like it. But he was being so really problem. apologetic about it. He's like, dude, I feel so bad. Like, I just, I'm like, no, 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 I get it. Like this all – I. 100% sounds about right. I am amazed that it lasted until now because it was a hustle. It was. I, I'll give you one more, too. I remember working at a gas station, and I, you know, when guys would buy scratch-offs and they would scratch them off in front of you, I felt like I had a knack for picking when another winner was coming up in, like, the next two or three. Okay. So in, inevitably, I would, I would grab some uh, scratch-offs and start scratching off. Well, there was one point where old boy here didn't have a lot of cash. Yeah. And, uh, and he grabbed uh, scratch offs. So I was like, oh, those three didn't work. Well, it's got to be the next three. Oh, how many did the you next scratch? Three didn't work. How many did you scratch I, off? I, I, mean, I think I scratched off like 15 in a row that were losers of like, <laughs> they were like $20 scratch off oh. or something. Like there was like one winner in there, but it was like you win your money back or something. Okay, well, how did you and, have to report that though? Like, how did you get around the part where you clearly stole? Well, I was one? a kid, so I didn't. So. Okay, right. That's it. So, <laughs> so this was less a hustle and more just theft. Is really. Yeah. All this, I'm like, I'm like, Jeremy, me tell me. To a felony. <laughs> right. no. Like, Jeremy, tell me about the hustle that you had, and he's no, like, but, Why don't I tell you about stupid. the time I committed a crime? <laughs> like, here's how stupid I was. I took off like like the last ticket, and then I would slide it back in there as I removed all the other ones. Uh, and I'm like, well, they'll never know because obviously when they look at it, this is the next number. Right. And then immediately they look at it and go, something's not right. Yeah, here. That's not right. A hundred percent. That's yeah. not right. I was I was t- okay. I'll, I'll give you two back. So one, um, I, I I worked. I was dating a girl, and her cousin wanted to open a. Na- I, I was a junior in high school. Her cousin wanted to open a NASCAR store in the Hartford Mall, which, uh, like, when you say those words together, it sounds like that would work, right? Like, yeah. NASCAR, Hartford Mall. Yeah, okay, checks out. And he said, he said, would you want to work there? And I was like, I, I, I guess. Like, you know, I don't know if you're going to pay me, right? I think I was working at, like, an old Navy or something at the time, so that sounded just as good, if not better. And, like, fine, I'll go there. I show up the first day, and it's clearly some sort of money laundering scheme. Like, there's, there's no <laughs> signs up in the store. There's no, like, price tags. And there's never a customer that comes in. Like, it never happens. I go there every day after school, and I just work for, like, six hours, and I can take my homework with me, and I can have friends come visit me. and Like, because and, like, there's never going to be a customer. It's never happened. <laughs> every day they're like, you got to keep a, you know, a running tally of what you sold. And I'm like, at most, I sold one like hat or car at most 
I've never had a day where I sold $100 worth of, of gear from this NASCAR store. But the job goes on for a little while. And then suddenly after Christmas, they shut the whole thing. They, they sold, we sold a bunch of gift cards right after Christmas, and then they shut it down the day after Christmas. <laughs> like, now, I to- isn't, that like, isn't there also like a big conspiracy theory about like, uh, like mattress stores? Like everybody thinks that they're money laundering because not that many people are buying mattresses this often. So they oh, be popping up all over the place. Yeah, that was like a big conspiracy theory. I, I'll believe that. I'll be- I, th- I've accepted many more things in my life to be money laundering schemes. Like I have... The more I've done, I think Ozark has ruined me, by the way. Like, now I'm yeah. looking out for what's a money laundering scheme. I go to get my uh, my hair cut at a place that won't accept credit cards, and I'm like, ah, because it's a money laundering scheme. I get it yeah. now. <laughs> I'm not mad about it. It's a good haircuttery, you know? Like, I'm fine yeah. with it. Uh, but I, So I do this, and the, guy, the, guy, the store shuts down, and I'm like, well, all right, that's about right. That's a bummer for me because I was able to do my homework and stuff and, and not have to deal with customers, but... You know, I get it. It's a money laundering scheme. No big deal. But then I realized he hadn't paid me at all for December. I'm like, wait a second. I haven't gotten my money. And then the guy stops answering my calls, right? And I'm not dating his cousin anymore, so there's no there's no in there any longer. And I'm like, huh, this yeah. becomes a problem. So I somehow, my, my then best friend and I concoct a scheme because I realized the key that I had still worked to get into the store. Like I, it's, So I said, why don't we just go take a bunch of stuff out of the store and then like tell him, hey – when I get my check, you can have all your stuff back. And we convinced ourselves that this crime that we were committing was like a really good, smart idea because we were 16 years old. We were like, this is, <laughs> this is brilliant. So like two idiots, and by the way, my friend legitimately wore all black and like a beanie, like, like obviously in the middle of a mall where we're going <laughs> in to steal things from the store. And we come in with like trash bags and we just load up like all these stupid you know, like decal cars and these like NASCAR helmets and stuff. We take everything that we can take and we put it in like four trash bags and we carry it. Like, it's so obvious. I can't believe we didn't get arrested walking out of this place. <laughs> so we, we get back and I, and I send him a message. I just say, you know, hey, man, whenever, you know, I get my money, you can have your stuff. And I hear nothing from him, nothing. And then like four months later, I see him at like a TGI Fridays. And I'm like, Jeez. Dude, what the hell? And he looked at me. He's like, oh, sorry. And he just literally took out his checkbook and wrote me. A, he's like, what do I owe you? And I'm like, I, I don't know, 400 bucks. And he was like, here, you know, you can have it. And then I say, well, do you want your stuff back? And he was like, no, 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 no. I wrote it off as being stolen. <laughs> like, don't. I got oh. money back on that. Don't give it yeah. back to no, me. No, I'm good now. Yeah, right? <laughs> and so. You tried to I, sell that. Yeah, and that was the problem. I was stuck. Out. I, like, held on to all this stuff. And, like, I'd have friends come over, like, why is half of your room old NASCAR helmet? Man, you love Jeff Gordon. <laughs> right? <laughs> God, why, why do you have a Dale Earnhardt Jr. jacket? What is that? And I'm like, I, it's a long story, man. I, I can't answer that question. It's like I've never met a larger Elliot Sandler <laughs> fan. That's crazy. I don't even know who that is. That is a really. I a real guy. I think uh, I made that up. That just came out of nowhere. Oh, God, man. Yeah, uh, just committing crimes. Here we go. That's what we're doing now in this segment is Jeremy and I just admit the, and hope that the Statue of Limitations has run up for Tell all where the bodies are buried. All the things that we've done. All right. Um, how are you handling it with the Batista thing? Where, where are you at? I mean, it sucks. Like, we were talking about it today. And, and again, like, you're, you try to remain positive and do the whole next man up thing. But it's not just – you're not just losing a closer because I, I feel like the way you could have used Batista in the postseason would have been like, unlike, unlike anything that we've seen here in Baltimore, because you know, when, when we watched Andrew Miller and uh, Araldis Chapman going at it, those guys literally pitched against each other until their arms fell off when the Cubs played the guardians in the world series or the Indians at that right. point. So um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's something. And now you're trying to replace what a lot of people believe are the hardest three outs to get in sports. So uh, it's not an enviable position to be in, but Cano's been pitching better. You just called up Hall. I don't think it's the end of the world, but let's let's not minimize this. I mean, you're losing a very important player. Yeah, this is the way I said it. Like, I, the season's not over. You know, it's not don't stop. What, it, it's just that we can't pretend like this guy wasn't having one of the best seasons in the history of relief pitchers, the fifth best strikeout rate um, of any pitcher that's pitched at least 60 innings in a season. We, we can't – like, he was the team MVP. He was the most consistent performer from day one. Like, you, you can't you can't pretend like that's not real. And, I look, I 
I hope that Yanir Cano does a, a solid job, and I hope that D.L. Hall becomes the guy that a lot of us have thought D.L. Hall should be for the last couple of years, and maybe that's where Tyler Wells is going to help moving forward, and I hope all those things are true, but I, I think the bigger problem is that we all know that this thing was already a little flimsy. It, it's, it's not fair to compare this team to the 2012 Orioles because that was comical, right? This is not that. This is a good baseball team. But we know it's a good baseball team with a lot of warts, and there's a reason why they have the second-best record in baseball but only the seventh-best run differential in baseball, and it's because they're just imperfect. And to lose anything of significance when you have an imperfect team really makes it difficult to believe that there's a path towards you know making a deep run trying to win a World Series. Yeah, I mean, I think even if we just look at this series this weekend, they trailed in all three games, had to come back to win two. Uh, almost came back and won the third, in which we probably wouldn't be talking about some of this stuff. But I don't think the Orioles played particularly well this weekend. Um, and now you get the White Sox, who are another team that's kind of like hung them up. They're, it's uh, Cancun on three. I think that's, right. that's what you're dealing with with this team. Mm-hmm. So you're supposed to come in and handle them as well. Um, yeah, I mean, like the, the whole thing just sucks because like we were having this magical season, and he was definitely a big part of it. Like I don't dismin- uh, I, I don't want to dismiss or diminish – what a, what a closer does, but you were talking about the numbers that he's, he's put up. I mean, they're historical. Like it's, he's having that type of season where it's like, and I, I don't know what records he'd end up breaking. There are a couple, but, um, but you look at that and being able to have that postseason, you're just shortening the game. So if he only goes an inning, now you need to figure out the other eight, but if he's able to go two, it changes up what you can do on a daily basis. And that's what I was talking about a minute ago with our guy, um, Eric. I said, look, man, you know, who, by the way, I'm still talking to you despite the fact that, and I, it was a really difficult decision for me because he, he did come for us last week. Um, oh, I saw that. Yeah, but the, the reality is he's just wrong. Like, he's just wrong. That's the way that it goes. Um, I said to him, like, look, the, 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 we talk about it as being the story is Cano or Wells or, you know, Webb or D.L. Hall, whoever you want to say it is. The story really to me is they'll overcome this if they play better baseball all around. You know, like, mm-hmm. I, I, they got to get more. I, we can keep saying, well, Jack Flaherty has been competitive and he wasn't bad yesterday. Like, they, they need Jack Flaherty to be a guy that's giving them six to seven innings every time out. Like, he's that guy. He's the guy that doesn't have innings limits. Like, that's the guy they needed to get. And if they didn't get that guy, they got the wrong guy at the deadline. Like they, I, they, I, by, the, by the way, I got news for you. I talked to a buddy in St. Louis that uh, – covered him for a while and he was like he said hey this is jack flaherty like yeah. he doesn't he's using air quotes and he says he always says i i didn't bounce back so you're like he he remembers all the times of skipping starts where he hasn't bounced back and felt the way he normally does and usually that's doom and gloom i mean good for him he got to face the rockies and he was okay but right. should have been better correct like that but th- if there's a path if there's a path to making up for it it's everybody's got to be better they got to score more runs they can't play as many one run games they were able to play this many one run games because they had Felix Batista at the back end of the bullpen without that they they just can't be putting themselves in one run games constantly and so yeah. if they can do that if they can avoid those situations then i think they'll have a chance to overcome this if they're going to be otherwise the exact same team I, I, could they still win the division? Of course they could still win the division. But are they going to do anything of significance after that? I, I, I find that very hard to believe. Yeah. And that's kind of – that's where I'm at too. I mean, you look at it. I was talking to guys this morning. If you're not paying attention, the Seattle Mariners just took the lead out west, uh, one of the hottest teams in baseball right now. Um, you know, all the teams you're going to face, again, it's not like it's a must to have that dominant closer to win games, but – it does hurt you, and and I feel like this is just another one of those things. When you have the, when you're probably going to have the lowest payroll in baseball or in the postseason when it starts, which I think that's probably a foregone conclusion. Um, if you, if that's going to be you, you can't afford to lose guys that are having this type of an impact on a team, and then hope that you're going to go far. I mean, again, it doesn't mean that they can't. I just think it's 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 another ding there where you feel like, hey, things aren't going our way. Yep. I'm with you. That's uh, that's the reality of it, and that's what they're dealing with. Um, Jeremy, not to end on such a, a damper of a note, but you shared something, and I, you know, I I don't think a lot of people knew because Sanzi was talking about it over the weekend, but I'm not sure they were aware of who this this other young man was. But um, of all of the people in our lives that that should not be going through any more heartbreak or sadness, can you share a little bit about what's going on with Sanzi and her family right now, and and what you're trying to do to help them? 
Yeah, so we had a going away party on Saturday for a friend that works at Hopkins that has been involved with Johns Hopkins Children's Center. And um, they were telling me Sanzi was coming. And then all of a sudden we got the message that she wasn't, that her stepson um, had, uh, had had a cardiac arrest and passed. And we were like, that, that can't be right. Like Isaiah, Isaiah is a really sweet kid. If you were around Mo in his last couple years, you would have Isaiah would have been there right by his side when any of us were bringing food over, going to play video games. Isaiah was sitting right there with us playing games. Like I said, a really sweet kid. Um, and and when you think about it, like I mean, this is the fourth child that Sansi's going to have to bury now. Um, for people that don't know, she lost twin girls um, early on uh, when they were born. Obviously, the story with Mo, and then you know, like. A lot of us can't speak to losing a child, and then now you're, you know, you have a stepchild that you're taking care of, and the bond that you're probably starting to grow with them, and then that's ripped out from under you. And um, just a young kid that was very deserving. And I think sometimes we forgot how young Isaiah was because, you know, with Mo's cancer, his gr- uh, growth was stunted, so he was like half the size of Isaiah, even though Isaiah was like, I, I want to say four or five years younger than him. It may have been more than that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, he was a young kid that just – and the family deserves better, man. I'm just seeing all these posts, and they kind of break your heart. So I'm trying to help him pay for the funeral. I, I texted with Sanzi this morning to make sure it was okay. Um, so we're raising some money, kind of like what we did, and I'm starting to see it sprinkle in. All the money's going to go to them to help pay for the funeral and, and, and maybe a wake if we can, depending on what we get in. But I'm going to try to throw a chunk their way as well. Um, I'm sending you something right now. Um, I, I just can't even I, – I, as as you and I have talked about a lot, Sanzi is one of the most wonderful and remarkable humans that I've ever known. And for for her and for for them to be going through this again is just unfathomable. Um, so remind everybody what your Venmo, your PayPal, all that stuff is. Yeah, it's, it's all on social media. I mean, my Venmo. And look, this isn't the preferential way to do it. We talked about a GoFundMe, and then they take a portion of it. I just told her, I said, look, I don't care about the tax stuff at the end of the year. I'll figure all that stuff out. Just. If you're sending it, you can send it, and I forward it all to them, um, or I'll just set up and I'll just pay for the funeral. Whatever's left, I'll send to them too. But it's uh, uh, Venmo is Jeremy Dash Con Dash Seven, uh, PayPal. Um, my, it's my work email, but I think it's at jcon22, and then uh, my cash app is Jeremy Con22. So we've done this a couple times for the player on my basketball team. We obviously did this for Mo a few times. Um, just a family that does, I know they're, look, they're not making a ton of money. I know what they, they both do for a living. They're, they're sweet people. They're working their asses off. Um, but this is just something that I don't care how well off you are. You don't want this dropped in your lap and you never want to see it happen to anyone. Uh, it's, it's, it's just unfathomable. It's really yeah. unfathomable, man. But I appreciate as always what you do for them. And uh, as we continue to try to lift up, um, really good people that don't deserve this. So Thank you for that. All right. Thanks, man. Um, we will talk again. Actually, we won't talk next Monday because we'll be off next Monday. So we'll talk again in two weeks. So you won't even call me just to tell I'm doing and you know, ask maybe me random I'll, questions? You know what? Maybe I'll force you to, to come on your own show because I think I'm hosting your show next Monday. Okay. <laughs> then just call me and I'll come on that. Then. <laughs> yeah, right. We got to We got to <laughs> What an amazing get we have. The host of this show is our next guest. <laughs> yeah, uh, he, he decided not to take the whole day off. Right. He only wanted some of the day off. Uh, love Please you, buddy. Bastard. Appreciate you, pal. Love we'll you talk. guys, too. Thanks so much for everything, man. Seriously. Of course, bud. We'll talk soon. Jeremy Kahn with us here on uh, 105.7 The Fan. As, uh, yeah, uh, if you didn't see that over the weekend, just un- unimaginable. Um, and um, anything you can do to lift up uh, Sanzi and her husband, uh, it would be really, truly appreciated. And um, I'll share that out again as well on social media so that you can get in touch with Jeremy. And um, really, I, I I just can't even, I can't, I, there are not words for this. There really are not. We'll grab a break here. Um, so a lot to do as we continue on a Monday edition of Glenn Clark Radio. Catch that festival feeling in Charm City. Everywhere you go, you'll find exciting entertainment, delicious eats, and endless summertime fun. Cheer on the O's at Camden Yards, pick crabs by the waterfront, beat the heat inside a world-class museum, and make memories that will last a lifetime. Go to Baltimore.org for more information and to plan your visit. It's game on every day at Live Casino and Hotel Maryland. Here, you are in on every play with 100-foot screens at Sports & Social, the best table games action, and FanDuel Sportsbook 
all just steps away. The best bar bites and drinks to indulge in steaks and curated cocktails. Your game day only gets better when matched up with Live's distinguished dining options. Late game, no problem. Our luxury hotel awaits. Live Casino and Hotel Maryland is the place to be on game day and every day. For more information, visit www.maryland.livecasinohotel.com. At Arundel Mills, must be 21, please play responsibly. For help, visit mdgamblinghelp.org or call 1-800-GAMBLER. All electronic tolling is here to stay in Maryland, and driveeasymd.com helps you cruise a little easier. We're Maryland's tolling resource, home to Easy Pass, pay-by-play, and video tolling. It's never been easier to pay your way. Driveeasymd.com will keep you moving. The Orioles are off and running out to prove that last season wasn't a fluke and they are one of the best teams in baseball. Hi, I'm Paul Valley, host of the Bat Around for Press Box. Tune in every Saturday from 10 a.m. to noon as Zach Goodman and I break down every Adley bomb, every Tony Tater, and every save from the mountain. Like a warm hug from Rutschman, the Bat Around has you covered with all things Orioles as we embark on what's sure to be a magical summer in Birdland. So tune in every Saturday for the best in Orioles coverage right here on the Bat Around. Picking a restaurant to try for the first time? Let's look at the Costas Inn. Here's a few checklist items. Quality of the food, check. Quality of service, check. Does restaurant have plenty of free parking? Check. And finally, does restaurant have delicious steamed crabs, crab cakes, crab soup, and specials galore? Check, check, check. Costas Inn, 4100 North Point Boulevard. They check all the boxes. The latest edition of Press Box is available now. On the cover, Bo Smolka dives into what's next for Lamar Jackson after receiving one of the biggest contracts in football history. Is Lamar ready to take the Ravens to the next level, now with a new offensive coordinator and new wide receivers? Also inside, we look at what new football coaches Brian Newberry and Pete Shinnick bring to Navy and Towson, respectively. And we meet players from the college football and soccer programs around the state. Press Box is available for free at over 500 area locations, including 60 Royal Farm stores. And you can always find the higher edition as well as the best daily coverage of the O's, Ravens, and Serps at PressBoxOnline.com. It's another exciting weekend of affordable family fun at Prince George's Stadium with the Bowie Bay Sox. Last weekend of the regular season kicks off on Friday the 8th with Adley Rutschman Night. Mystery Adley Rutschman giveaway items for the first 750 fans. Fireworks on Saturday with the return of our 1K beer run. See how fast you can complete the race while getting three beers down. And our Birdland celebration on Sunday. Free autograph items for the first 1,000 fans. Get your tickets now by calling 301-805-6000 or anytime online at BaySox.com. The Bowie Bay Sox. Let us be your nine-inning vacation. That first sip that first bite mm. start your day off right with a delicious breakfast at royal farms choose from a fantastic selection of fresh royal farms breakfast sandwiches and top it off with a rich hot cup of the freshest coffee in the world at royal farms breakfast is available day and night it's the freshest breakfast in the world real fresh real fast royal farms Hey, Birdland, the next time you visit Camden Yards, stop by the brand new Superbook Bar and Restaurant, the first ever sports lounge at Oriole Park. The Superbook Bar and Restaurant is open to all fans once the gates open for each game. Enjoy first-rate food and beverage with a state-of-the-art viewing experience, including newly installed TVs, odds boards, and sports tickers. Get your game tickets now, then stop in for a 360-degree sports experience. Learn more at orioles.com superbook. If you need more of Glenn, you can also hear him every Sunday with Rita on 105.7 The Fan. But also, if you need more of Glenn, um, what's wrong with you? All right, back in here on GCR as we continue along on a Monday edition of the program. Stan The Fan Charles, Ross Grimsley, Luke Jackson, they're getting together today, 4 o'clock, to talk some baseball with you. Facebook.com slash Sports. If you miss it live, you'll be able to see it later tonight or tomorrow at youtube.com slash pressboxonline or pressboxonline.com slash video. Stan the Fan Charles, former Oriole Ross Grimsley, and Luke Jackson. They will be getting together, facebook.com slash pressboxsports. My column is up at pressboxonline.com, detailing a lot of the things that we've talked about this morning related to the Felix Batista injury and the impact it has on the Orioles. You can go check it out right now, again, at PressBoxOnline.com. Daddy appreciates the clicks. All summer long, we have been celebrating the 40th anniversary of the Orioles' run to the 1983 World Series title. It was great to have these guys back in Baltimore just a couple of weeks ago. 
Joining us now here on GCR, an outfielder from the 83 Orioles, he is the great Gary Renicki, and he's with us now on the program. Gary, it's Glenn in Baltimore. It's great to catch up. Thank you for taking a couple of minutes for us this morning. My pleasure, Glenn. Good morning. It's great to chat with you, man. I, I just, you know, before we get into 83 and reliving the memories, just the, the being up here uh, in front of a absolutely sold-out crowd at Camden Yards and the special team that's going on, being around these guys, can you put into words what that weekend was like? Um, you know, you really, you really can't. I know we're still talking about it. Uh, I think what was more impressive is when I got back here to California, I go to YouTube to look at stories, you know, and catch up on news. And the 83 reunion, people took videos and, and put it through, you know, so everybody could see. So it was pretty much national news there for a while, it you was, know, for, for all of us that follow YouTube. Yeah, well, I'm telling you, it was special. I mean, for I got chills. You know, the Eddie Chance, Rick acting a fool. Like, oh, yeah. I, I got legitimate chills, not just celebrating you guys, right? Because that's, that's a big, that's right. a massive part of it. But, like, tying in celebrating you guys to us being reminded of how much this city loves this team and loves baseball and, like, just needed an, a reason to come back out and remind everybody of that and how this year's team has provided of it. It all just kind of seemed to run together in the most perfect way that night. It, it did. It did. It was well organized, and the excitement. And like you said, it wasn't just for us. You know, everybody was involved with this: the fan base, the city, the media, uh, everybody working together. You know, one giant team. And uh, I know when I did get back here a few days later, uh, Rick Dempsey and I we talked to each other on the phone, and Rick brought that up. He said that was so much fun. So even a few days later, you know, when we're talking about other things, we're still talking about that particular weekend. That's really cool. And to all of us and, and the excitement and seeing a packed house at that stadium, you know, I I wish we could have played at that stadium. That, I, that is such a beautiful – you know, they did a great job building Camden Yard, without I, a doubt. I, I can't remember who it was that we were talking about this with. It was somebody that we chatted with recently, but for a moment it kind of felt like the electricity of Memorial Stadium, right? Like it – it really like that's the one that, as beautiful as Camden Yards is, as immaculate as a facility as it is, the right. electricity of, thir- of of Memorial Stadium is something that it's very hard to describe to a young person. That place was just a madhouse, and for I thought we were back there when Rick was spelling out Oriole. I right? thought we were back in back it, on Thirty Third Street. It felt like Memorial it Stadium. It had that feeling for a moment. It really. I get. I'm telling you, I'm getting goosebumps thinking about it right now, Gary. Like it, <laughs> it really. Was, it was so much fun. It, it was, really was. That's so cool to hear you say that, man. Uh, Gary Ranicky. I, I, everybody that I've talked to this summer, and I've had just about everybody on, uh, has that was part of the '79 team. Said in '83. All we were thinking about was we couldn't let that happen again. We had to make sure that we got the taste out of our mouth of 79. How much of that was a driving factor for you and for that ball club? Well, we came, I think it was because we had the core group of players outside of Ripken. You know, Cal Cal probably got us over that hump. We came so close, you know, the year before. But, you know, we talked about it during that weekend. From so that 79, something, you know, we lost the three games to one lead in the series. 1980, we were second best record in all baseball, didn't go to the playoffs. 81 with a strike year was just all messed up. And then, you know, 82, we were tied. So we were that close, that close. And I think 83, we were going to win despite whoever the manager was. Hmm. It, it, it didn't matter. You know, we were going to win it. You had just been through so much at that point that it, it was your time. We know, right. we've talked all summer about the adversity that you guys faced that year. That There were two different seven-game losing streaks during the course of the season. Um, and I say this because there's a comparison made, like the, the current Orioles are going through a lot of adversity. What was mm-hmm. it about your group that allowed for that not to overwhelm you, that you could just go through these stretch? I mean, my God, I, I can't even imagine what everybody in town was talking like in 1983 when that was going on. <laughs> I know, you know, I can't recall it, what we felt like. I didn't even know we had two seven-game losing streaks, but that just just tells you that how you can overcome when you do have bad stretches because it is 162 games. It is a marathon season. So, you know, as long as you don't get into a hole right at the start or have somebody go off like the Tigers did, Tigers did the following year in 84, mm-hmm. you can stay right there and all of a sudden you, you start, you know, 
we always said if we can get into a pennant race in August, the dog days of August, and then that gets you through into September and when you're close, now you're playing for something you kind of forget about. I played 130 games. Now I'm tired. The humidity's kind of draining me. You know, there's something, there's like a light at the end of the tunnel. So when you can just kind of stay close and with that pitching staff we had and we had solid defense and guys would come up with big hits in the course of that season, we knew that there was something special that was ahead. What about the fact that you guys had, like, I think 57 outfielders on that roster? What about the fact that you all were in unique situations for playing time? Of course, no you and Brother Low and platooning. Mm-hmm. But h- how did you all handle that? That, like, you know, th- th- there's there was just such a glut of outfielders on that roster. Right. Well, I didn't know we were going to even platoon. That was never mentioned. Wow. So we, we get – because Earl didn't platoon us. We played, John and I played a lot together. Yeah, and, and so when we got to 83, and all of a sudden the season started going, and, you know, there's some right-handers out there that I hit pretty well, and I'm not playing. And then John just never, ever saw a left-hander. Then we kind of figured, okay, a month or two into the season, I guess that's how we're going to be used. Was um, it- and then the other outfielders, you know, Shelby and, and Bumbry's time, they were splitting some time there, and Singleton was dh a lot. We brought Dan Ford in, and like I said, there was a lot of guys. There was probably six guys that could have played full-time, but how do you do that when you only have three spots and a DH? Did it require, like, a, you know, a, a humility? I mean, you were coming off a, a, a massive season in 82. Did it require – humility did it require having to be openly talking about the situation like i i feel like yep. you know professional athletes are, are not always i i know that you'll never hear this before gary i think some professional athletes have a bit of an ego um so how did you guys handle that and and make it work together to become a championship team well to be honest i mean you are right with a, with an ego we all we all want to play and that's <clears throat> a manager wants a player to play i mean he wants him to want to play um, I personally, for me, I wasn't happy about that situation. John was ecstatic because that gave him more playing time and me less time. <laughs> but, but, but what, what, what I looked at is, you know, what's better for me to play more and us to lose or not win as many games or to work it the way that it's been working. And it has been, you know, where the platoon did work that year. What's more important, us winning or just me getting more playing time? So I kind of said, well, you know, we've got to win a world championship here, and we've come so close for so many years. You know, let's kind of forego what – because John was having a good year. If he was not having a good year, yeah. I would have been vocal. But he had a fantastic year that season. So, you know, why rock the boat? What, go with it. You mentioned the manager before. Obviously, everybody knows that, that this is Joe Altabelli showing up and – he certainly had a history with some guys that were part of that team, but what what was it like adjusting to Joe? I mean, I there was there was a you know an urban legend around here that maybe you guys you know wanted to, to prove to Earl that like hey we didn't need you or something like that. Like the, what was it like making that adjustment, and what did he? Because I feel like he's a forgotten part about that team. You know, like that I, I bet there are mm-hmm. some Orioles fans I had to be reminded that it wasn't Earl that was managing that team and that he was in the booth during right. the World Series. What was sure. it about Joe out the belly that made it work with that group? Well, for me, it wasn't – I never thought about want to play harder just to show Earl. That, I, I didn't think of it that way. Joe, there was a big contrast difference between the two, obviously. Joe's a very mellow, very, very nice man. And he didn't really take over the reins like so, so much Earl did. With Earl, you knew who was manager and you knew who was in charge. And he made it known. With Joe, he kind of sat back a little bit more, being the first year there. Cal Ripken Sr. pretty much ran the position players, and Ray Miller ran the pitch. So all those three guys worked together. You know, Joe wrote the lineup, obviously. But he just kind of sat back and smile on his face and very calming force and, you know, didn't get on guys if they did something wrong like Earl would do at times. So there was a big difference, but I don't think we were we wanted to win just to show Earl up. I, that was Earl that was really Earl's team. The same pretty much team we had in eighty two. Almost entirely, no doubt about it. Uh the fact that you had those young guys at the top of the rotation, uh, like how how long did it take you to realize again, one of those things that I, I think people might not remember. It wasn't Palmer, right? Like he he was there, but he wasn't the reason 
the, the Mike Boddicker's of the world, the Scotty McGregor's, the Storm Davis's. How quickly mm-hmm. did you guys realize, like, this is not maybe, you know, the, the, the murderer's row of McNally, Palmer, Cuellar or something like that, but right. we're, we're right. going to be good. Like, this is going to work with this group of guys. Well, every time Boddicker came up in previous years, he pitched well. Yeah. You know, when he had a few starts and then he'd go back down to, to AAA. Uh, Storm, you know, had an electric arm. They were different type pitchers. Uh, they have Palmer, even though Jim wasn't the main starter that he'd been for all those years, he was he was still right there. Mm-hmm. He would talk how to set up hitters, what this guy liked. He was like a, you know, with his memory, he could. it was the scouting report built in his head. So he helped these guys, you know, greatly. And, and Flanagan would keep guys loose with his humor and his, and his knowledge. But I think they were all different pitchers. So that also is, a, is good on a, when you're facing somebody. Because when you're a, a hitter like I was, if I see the same type of pitching night after night after night, I'm going to really adjust and I'll probably do well in that second or that third night if I'm facing the same type of pitching. These guys are all different. I so know. that helped out too, and it all worked. It all worked significantly. There's no doubt about it. All right, the uh, the most important question: When you guys got back together, which of the guys was doing the most storytelling? Where you realized <laughs> at some point the story was not exactly the way that you remembered it being. Who <laughs> whose stories had maybe grown the most over the course of 40 years? Well, I I. We did, we did bring – you know what's amazing when you go back after all those years? Some of these guys we haven't seen in a long time. And, yeah. and I – a few, you know, when we had the fantasy camps and, you know, five years ago, every five years. But some of the guys we haven't seen in a long time, and their, their memories are still so sharp. I think the, the, the funny one is, is Tippy, you know, because I brought it up a couple times when guys would ask me questions about that 83 team. And I said, well, when Tippy Martinez can pick off three guys right. in one inning, you know, and he only picked off three guys. I don't know. I don't know if it's true, but the story would have said, oh, Tippy picked off three guys in his career all in one inning. <laughs> you know, but he would stretch out that like, oh, no, I had a I had a good move, you know, and I just wanted, I figured, oh, you know, Sakata's catching, Renneke's at third, Lowenstein's at second. They might think they can try to run. So I'm going to I'm gonna just give them a so-so move, and then I'll give them my good move. Well, that's not what happened, but what is <laughs> I am actually trying to find out now. I am actually panicked about whether or not Tippy Mar- how many other ru- ba- runners Tippy Martinez picked off in his career. I am going to have yeah. to spend some time thinking about that today <laughs> in order to get that answer because oh, God. that yeah, is that tremendous. Was amazing game. Um, Gary, what else is going? Uh, what, what else is going on in your world? Obviously, you know it's funny. I, I think I just taught chatted with. I think I taught during the pandemic. I chatted with Josh because. He was like one of the first athletes in the world to start playing sports again um, yeah. because he was overseas and they started playing a little bit yeah. before we did here. And that was the last time I caught up with him. What else is going on in your world? What are you up to these days? Well, we're, we're a kind of on a road trip now. We decided because we have, we have three sons, two of them were born in Baltimore, you know, yep. in those Oriole years. They were born back there in GBMC. And so we're all scattered over the country now. We got one in California, Southern California, where I am now. We have one in Florida, where Josh is. We have one in Idaho. So we want to bounce around and see the grandkids, spend more time with them, since we're healthy enough to do that. So that's what we're going to try to do now. We're first stop is Southern Cal, and then in the spring we'll go to Florida and stay there for a year. And you know, Josh has four kids, so we get to kind of be part of their lives. Wow. And then we'll move on to Idaho, and then after that. We'll see how healthy we are and see where we want to end up. But that's pretty much the game plan. That doesn't sound like a bad way to spend some time, though, Gary. That sounds like it. Oh, it's, it's, yeah, yeah. We do what we can, you know. I mean, you know, sadly to say that, you know, it brought back bad memories when we were just about ready to take the field and and the Jumbotron had the members of that 83 team that are no longer with us, you know, and Rich Dower is battling, you know, one year now he's been kind of pretty much laid up. So we just never know when, you know, your life can change. It can change in a, in a heartbeat. And so, God willing, we can have our health and, and do these kind of things. And well, we were so grateful to have you guys back for that weekend, man. It was just a, a really, really wonderful, wonderful way to celebrate your team and celebrate baseball in Baltimore. 
uh, Gary Renicki, truly appreciate you spending a couple of minutes with us this morning. Thank you for doing this, and uh, continued safety and health to you, your family. All right. Thank you, Glenn. Appreciate it. And like I said, I, I mean, it was also special because it, the season the Orioles are having. It's it's That's awesome. Kind of added to it. It's so yeah, it's so cool. So. Thank you, sir. Appreciate you, Gary Renicki. Um, I, I I do. I was getting goosebumps thinking about how special that night was. It really was a one of the great nights and modern times of of me being around the Orioles, just celebrating with those guys and the fact that the team's got all of it. It all makes it just so. It was such a remarkably special time. Appreciate Gary Renicki hopping on with us this morning. All right, uh, we need to recap picks. Can you please send a text right now to John Proctor and Andrew okay. Stecka and just say, can Glenn want to know if one of you could please make a spreadsheet? Normally, that's taken care of beforehand, so I haven't had to deal with this. And I'm telling that tell them that you will update it as an, I just need we need the spreadsheet to exist. If they if it's too much for them, that's fine. They don't work for us. They've just done it in the past, and I appreciated that. But if if we got to task you with that, yeah, we will do that. I just don't think that you know how to build that. Uh, I mean, yeah, it takes some time for sure. So find out if one of them would be willing to build it, and if they can't, say if they can't update it, you'll handle that moving forward. But it would be nice to have the spreadsheet <laughs> for me to reference because instead I had to manually go through and figure out what everyone's record was this weekend. Uh, Picks Recap, brought to you by Superbook Sports. If you had taken my suggestions from this past weekend and gone over to Superbook.com and registered using the code GlennClark23, and if your first bet was on San Jose State to cover against USC, like I told you, Unbelievable. you would have felt so good Unreal. about yourself, the greatest 28-point loss in football history. And if you had done that, not only would you have won whatever it is that you had bet on that particular selection, but that amount would also have been credited back to you in free bets moving forward. That's on you. Now, if you would say, taking the advice that I had given you on Hawaii Vanderbilt, you would have lost that money. But the good news, you still would have gotten the free bets right back. So think about that this week. Use the code GlennClark23. Get over to Superbook.com. Download the Superbook app. Take advantage of a first bet match up to $250. Win or lose when you use the code GlennClark23. Uh, we did only pick three games for the first weekend. And Slow for the yeah. most part, everybody was either 1-2 and two or 2-1. Two and one. A couple of people stand out from from the weekend <laughs> one for good reasons a couple for not so good reasons um the three games that we picked this weekend unfortunately navy notre dame obviously just uh, was not the navy's day they never really got going what did we learn from that i was reading bill wagner's column in the uh, capital i'm i'm not sure that we learned anything about navy did we learn did this prove that notre dame is legit well to a certain extent they're a very good team and sam hartman's a good quarterback but we kind of knew those things what we don't know yet is how Na Notre Dame is going to do when they play the USC's of the world, when they play the Ohio State's of the world. Are they ready to be a contender for a national championship? I, I, we can't learn that from a game against Navy. But, you know, a bummer. A bummer of yeah. a way to start the season that they just never got going in any way. That, that was disappointing. And ultimately, they, you know, they, they'll, they'll, their season will be determined clearly by not the Notre Dame game, but by the goals that they have at Navy to win the CIC trophy and to compete in the new-look AAC. So I just don't want to get too – I don't want to overreact too much to it. Uh, but 42-3 to three was the uh, final score there, and so Notre Dame did cover somewhat comfortably the line of 21. Um, Paul Valley, Kyle Ottenheimer – John, John Little, Little Rock, Rock, Ryan Shell, Andrew Stetka on Navy. Here's the stunner of the week. That's the only game Andrew Stetka lost. Oh, Andrew Stetka with a two, two and, and one, one weekend. Is he to leading? Start thing off. Not leading. Okay. Not leading. I haven't done my calculations yet. Yeah. But with a, a two-game lead on a couple of people <laughs> in this contest. 
The next game was, as I mentioned, San Jose State, USC. Ah, <coughs> chef's kiss. I went up to yeah. Philly on Saturday night. I went and saw Jimmy Eat World and Manchester Orchestra. It was a fun night. But I was distracted at first by the Orioles game, which I had, uh, like, literally, I'm the guy at a concert. Yeah. Like, legitimately, yeah. with the phone, with a game on my phone. It's not even a joke, with a game on my phone. <laughs> People looking over me like, what? You're at a concert. You're in Philly. I'm like, dude, what is it? Why do they think here? They, they're they incredulous that anyone would be watching a baseball game when you paid <laughs> money to go to a concert. But that's how excited I am about the Orioles, even after the Felix Batista injury. Um, it was, yeah, great atmosphere Saturday night, as Eric it, already mentioned. Yeah, yeah, it was sold out. It was, you know, it was awesome. Then, as we're leaving the concert, I am panicked because I was feeling good about where it was at the half. It was still somewhat close, and now USC's opened up a little bit of a lead, and now they're getting yes. the ball back up by four scores. I'm like, <gasps> thank God that was the end of it. Now, I didn't get to watch the game because it was on Pac-12 right. network, but I was following along on, on the, the ES. I 1,000% <laughs> was. Thankfully, no more damage. Nailed it. The line was 30 and a half. That was entirely too much. They were only four touchdowns better. And so, those of us that were on San Jose hey. State get a point. Uh, Griffin, Ken Kyle. Ken was right to be worried about that hook. And that was, Well, no, the hook wasn't the difference. Griffin, Kyle, Proctor, John from Little Rock, Nick Kelly, Ryan Chell. Hmm, a couple of names that have repeated there were all on USC. <laughs> the only one that I lost this weekend... Uh, this one was tough because it was going well in the first half. I was feeling very comfortable about Vanderbilt after a weather delay. I was feeling very good about it, but uh, Hawaii showed up in yeah, the second did. half, and they got it back within a score, and they got the ball back. Like They had a chance to even do more than that. That wouldn't have mattered to us, but um, Hawaii may be proving perhaps that they're a little bit better than they were a year ago. Hawaii stays within one touchdown. They cover the 17 and a half. Therefore, those that were on Hawaii get that point. Myself, Griffin, John from Little Rock, Nick Kelly, Ryan Chell, they were on Vanderbilt. Now, what two names did you hear me mention uh, all three games? Ryan was mentioned a lot. For Ryan sure. was mentioned a lot. And, and uh, I believe our good friend John. John and, and uh, Little, Little Rock's Rock. name was mentioned a lot. We had two 0 and 3s to start the season. And not, they, they weren't Andrew Stecka. To, they were not Andrew Stecka. Yeah. Andrew Stecka was better than you. Yeah, you might want to quit. I know. <laughs> you might want to quit. Just give up. <laughs> uh, Ryan Chell and John from Little Rock both 0-3 to start the season in our picks contest. Not great. Not great. However, on the flip side, a tremendous weekend for our pal Ken Zalis, whose name you didn't hear at all because he went 3-0. and So KZ moves to the top of the table. Great. John and Little Rock and Ryan are at the bottom of the table. Myself, Paul Valley, John Proctor, and Andrew Stetka, all two and one for week zero. Griffin, Kyle Ottenheimer, and Nick Kelly, all one and two. Not a great week for our newcomers. Yeah, as long as I'm not our, on three. Yeah. Our newcomers <laughs> went a combined one and eight. Ooh. One and eight. Nick Kelly went welcome one a, and welcome two. Welcome aboard, guys. Yeah, good to have you. <laughs> yeah. Newcomers want to combine one and eight in picks <laughs> this weekend. John uh, from Little Rock, Nick Kelly, and Ryan Chell. And uh, it really brought down the entire group. <laughs> really brought us down. So uh, that's where we are after week zero and the smallest number of picks that we'll have until the NFL playoffs. John Proctor said he should have time to get, get to it. All right, thank you. Create a thank spreadsheet you, for us. Thank you very much. I will, uh, I will look forward to that, and we will do uh, a more complete weekend of college football picks. Although I was looking over the upcoming weekend for college football, yeah, and I was like, I always love the first weekend of college football, but like I don't know, it's kind of not as great as I no. like remember. Now, part of this is we don't know who these teams are really going to be. Like, some of these teams that we don't think are exciting in week one might prove to be exciting. And inevitably, like, there's always going to be a game like LSU-Florida State's the big game this weekend. And somehow one of those teams is going to end up unranked by, like, week four. That's just the way that I feel like that always happens with whatever the marquee game of the weekend is. Um, Maryland, of course, opens the season against Towson. We'll have to monitor that because I don't know that there will be a spread up. Because oh, a lot gotcha. of times with FCS yeah. teams, they don't put the spread up until, like, day the of. Um, so you got to monitor that, and if there isn't one, we might have to go to a different source to try to find a spread for that right. game because you know it's the only local game this weekend, so we kind of have to include it. 
Morgan opens up on the road at Richmond this weekend, but uh, you know that won't be one that we will include in picks, of course. Um, I don't know the big uh, uh, Colorado plays a TCU. Yeah, Colorado TCU, mm. but like you have no idea. Yeah. Like that, you know the hype of Deion Sanders is there, but you have no idea what Colorado the is. Big Miami Miami matchup. Yes, <laughs> I I did a joke about. Do you remember the leg- legendary phone call where somebody called into Mike Francesa and asked if the San Francisco Giants and New York Giants ever get together for like a picnic? <laughs> I, I it's did, one of the I great calls heard. in the history of sports radio. And I shared that because I saw I was looking over the schedule for next week and I saw the Miami Miami game and I was like, that's basically just like somebody made a phone call like we should we should play against you. And the only reason why is because our names are both Miami. There is otherwise absolutely zero reason why Miami, Ohio should ever be playing Miami, Florida, but one Miami to rule them all this weekend. Uh, Virginia, Tennessee is okay. Ohio State opens with a conference game against Indiana, which is really interesting. Like I feel like they've yeah, that. I know the. I feel like they've done that before are... too. Uh, Penn State, West Virginia is this weekend. It's not, like there are good games, but there aren't. The only like marquee game of the weekend is LSU, Florida State on Sunday night. So like, oh, now Griffin's upset. You can play it. We can. Okay. We can. I don't. I don't think you should be the only one to hear. This well, is I back when sure, I wanted to make sure I had when yeah. Francesa's show used to air on uh, Fox Sports. There was a an account Damn. called like Funhouse that used to pull clip after clip after clip of the absurdity. The funny part being that it merged from it was an account making fun of the callers to at some point it made fun of Francesa because <laughs> truth is, Francesa actually did really well with this. Like he's become a caricature over the years. But he was still sharp at this point. This ended up being a really good response from Francesa to an absolutely bizarre phone call. Dan and Warwick, what's up, Dan? Uh, hey, Mike. Uh, I just got a, uh, a question about the Giants. Uh, in your years of experience, have you ever seen uh, you know this, how the San Francisco Giants were once the New York Giants? Has, has there ever been either a franchise to franchise or maybe even player to player get together when San Francisco comes to New York? Like, do they ever say hi? Question. Maybe. I don't know, go out to dinner or something. Uh, oh, I don't know. What, is, what are you talking about? Is there ever any interaction when the San Francisco Giants come to New York or vice versa? The San Francisco like, Giants it, come to New York and do what? Have a game. <laughs> I, you know, play they, with ever, the, like, they play against the Mets. And what do you want to happen now? Do the, do the New York Giants ever reach out to them, either the players or the franchise? The football you know, they, Giants? Yeah, the football Giants. Well, what is the co- connection between the San Francisco Giants and the football Giants? Well, they used to be in New York, and they got the same name. <laughs> but they have they have nothing to do with each other, though. There's no connection. Then they have different ownership. They there's no connection between the two teams. I mean, there's no connection in any way between the two teams. They have no relationship. Do you think because they're giants, they're like brothers or something? That might be the weirdest question I got in a long time. Right, that way, that, I this, mean, that might, the, this part is actually and, where and I think that's an honest question. That might be the strangest question I got in a really long time. Yeah, as a matter of fact, they have the giant picnic. Uh, they hold it over in, in Totowa, I think it is. Uh, and then they have the, the giant relay race and the giant raffle. And then they all get together for the giant breakfast the next morning, and then they go their separate ways. It is true. It's a, it's a July weekend. Every year when it happens. Yeah, and then the Rangers in Texas and the New York Rangers have the same thing. They meet usually in Abilene and have that in August every year. Lundquist is, is particularly close to Udavish. They, uh, as a matter of fact, there's a kinship there between the two of them. Here's the Mink Man. Yeah, and th- that actually was that part of it when he finally got there was actually pretty good. <laughs> like. Yeah, yeah, and the Rangers get together with the Rangers, and Lundquist and Darvish hang out. <laughs> like, that part of it was pretty good. Um, Francesa, of course, has had many highs and lows during his yes. career, but I thought that one was... I, the next video is uh, a, a caller. It's a four-minute video. A caller asks if a baseball team can go 162-0. and I mean, there's so many over there. And at some, of, at some point, Francesa's show became people trying to get on this Twitter account. Right. Like, at some point, it went to them asking insane things to try to get a rise out of him. <laughs> Or making fun of him and seeing if he caught on. And then it morphed into Francesca. Like the day that Stan Lee died, someone called Francesca and said, hey, did you hear about Stan Lee? And Francesca has no idea who Stan Lee is. One of the most iconic humans that has ever lived. And Francesca's like, oh, for God. Wait, s- superheroes. Like, you know, it's just chef's kiss. 
Yes. But um, that's all I could think about when I saw the Miami Miami matchup. I'm like, oh, it's the Mike Francis. It's the Dan and Warwick special. You've been asking for this. Does Miami of Ohio and Miami of Florida ever get together? <laughs> well, yes. This they're, Friday. This Friday. Oh, is it Friday? Yeah. Okay. Nice. They'll have a picnic while they're doing yeah. it. Um, yeah, not a ton of great games. But we'll pick seven of them this weekend. Uh, North Carolina, South Carolina is another one this weekend. Yeah. We'll pick seven of the better games this weekend. We'll pick those. Temple Akron, yeah. Yeah, that's obvious. The bi- all the big ones. Right. We'll just pick all of the really important can't-miss games of the weekend, like Albany Marshall, <laughs> obviously very high on that the is, list. Yeah. Uh, the South Citadel, Carolina State, Charlotte. Georgia right. Southern. Yeah, all the all the games that you can't – Southeastern Louisiana, Mississippi State, all the games you can't miss out SCLA. on. We'll make sure that we include them. I think uh, KZ said he was truly a sicko because he was watching Mercer, North Alabama at Atta one boy, point on KZ. Saturday. Have to. Have you to. indeed qualify Incarnate as Word as versus UTEP. Incarnate. Yeah. Incarnate Word. That's what UTEP. I said. Incarnate Word made a, a deep run in the – I think they might be becoming like an FCS power at this point and might maybe even be thinking about moving to the FBS really? level. We were we, North, North we were State. we were doing a bit on uh, Friday night when we were yes. over on 105.7 The Fan where we had a caller that was like quizzing me about because I did not know that Rich Rodriguez yeah. – was now co- I don't even remember who where is he? Uh, he's at Jacksonville State. Jacksonville State, and the they had gone FBS this year. Mm-hmm. And then I pointed out that the head coach at Sam Houston, who's also gone FBS this year, is former Delaware coach Casey Keeler. And you would say, well, why do you know? That was Joe Flacco's coach at Delaware, and so for a few years around here, Casey Keeler was a regular on Baltimore Sports Talk Radio. We would bring him on all the time to be like our Joe Flacco analyst. And then, you know, we could talk about Delaware going up against Towson yeah. or whatever. But we brought on Casey Keeler lots in Joe Flacco's uh, original years. So I was like, wow, that's where Casey Keeler ended up. I had no idea. So uh, we ended up in a, in a rabbit hole talking about the sickos that were watching college football this weekend. Did a full segment, I believe. Yeah, I think that was pretty <laughs> close to it. All right. Uh, when we come back in, we'll get a tidbit and we will get tubular to wind down for a Monday edition of Glenn Clark Radio. Hey, Birdland, the next time you visit Camden Yards, stop by the brand new Superbook Bar and Restaurant, the first ever sports lounge at Oriole Park. The Superbook Bar and Restaurant is open to all fans once the gates open for each game. Enjoy first-rate food and beverage with a state-of-the-art viewing experience, including newly installed TVs, odds boards, and sports tickers. Get your game tickets now, then stop in for a 360-degree sports experience. Learn more at orioles.com superbook. Hike to new heights. The best view is yours in Washington County. Our iconic scenic overlooks provide some of the most breathtaking vistas in the Mid-Atlantic. Some are very easy walks, some can be driven to, and some are the payoff for a moderate to difficult hike. All are near quaint small towns that offer great dining, shopping, hiking gear, and more. Explore our five national parks for iconic vistas and wineries with breathtaking views. Visit our quaint historic towns and make your stay unforgettable. Learn more at visithagerstown.com. Maryland, be open. America's biggest bike race returns to Maryland Sunday, September 3rd as 120 of the world's best cyclists race the Maryland Cycling Classic presented by United Healthcare. Come enjoy the free fan zones and festival with interactives, food, and drink beginning at noon. Then see the exciting race conclusion from 3 to 5 p.m. in the Inner Harbor. Come be loud, be proud, and let the world hear you. For more information, go to MarylandCyclingClassic.us. Soak up summertime fun in Charm City. Enjoy only in Baltimore festivals, mouth-watering eats, and endless entertainment. Cheer on the O's at Camden Yards. Pick crabs by the waterfront. Beat the heat inside a world-class museum and make memories that will last a lifetime. Go to Baltimore.org for more information and to plan your visit. You feel that? That's the sound of football coming back. And now's the time to place your preseason bets with Superbook Sports. Superbook is the most trusted name in Vegas. And now you can use my promo code. Glenn Clark 23 to score up to $250 with their first bet bonus. Win or lose, they'll match your first bet up to $250 with the promo code Glenn Clark 23. All one word, no spaces, two ends in Glenn. Don't miss out this football season. Win some money with Superbook 
sports and that promo code Glenn Clark 23. Visit Superbook.com for terms and conditions. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. I'm Michael Jan Grandy, president of AJ Michaels, your carrier energy expert for 44 years. Save money, energy, and make your home more comfortable and virus free. Find us at AJMichaels.com. That's AJMichaels.com. Maryland drivers, did you know you can save up to 77% on tolls with an Easy Pass Maryland discount plan? That's right, 77%. It's never been easier. Pick the plan that's right for you at driveezmd.com. We'll keep you moving. It's a Maryland thing. Where the waves meet the shore, you will find Dorchester County. Hi, this is Jimmy Charles. When I think of Maryland, I think Dorchester County on the eastern shore where it's open for making memories. Dorchester County, it's a Maryland thing. For more info, visit www.visitdorchester.org. It's a Maryland thing. Picking a restaurant to try for the first time? Let's look at the Costas Inn. Here's a few checklist items. Quality of the food, check. Quality of service, check. Does restaurant have plenty of free parking, check. And finally, does restaurant have delicious steamed crabs, crab cakes, crab soup, and specials galore? Check, check, check. Costas Inn, 4100 North Point Boulevard. They check all the boxes. Make the most out of every day in your Toyota RAV4. Available in hybrid or gas-only models. A RAV4 can get you where you want to go in style. Check out buyatoyota.com for deals on new RAV4s from your local Toyota dealer today. Check out pressboxonline.com every day to find daily winners and betting advice from Jeremy Kahn. And if you want some advice about life decisions that you probably shouldn't make, here's Glenn Clark. All right, back in here on GCR as we uh, continue along and wind down for a Monday edition of the program. We'll get a tidbit. Tidbits brought to you today by the print issue of Press Box, which is available at your neighborhood Royal Farms and at the hundreds of locations around town where you find Press Box. So you can read it all at PressBoxOnline.com. Great cover story from Bo Smolka, all about the contract era now for Lamar Jackson and what's next. Go pick it up today, the print issue of Press Box. What you got? Uh, so Corbin Carroll. Oh, by actually, the way, no, uh, I want to do. Uh, the, the, apparently, the Ravens are starting to make roster moves. Nothing of significance yet, uh, but Tom Pelissero of NFL Network shared that they had cut uh, uh, DeAndre Houston Carson, who they had signed during the preseason, and always seemed like he th- there wasn't really a path but someone that maybe they had hoped could be part of the solution as they were going through a lot of issues in the secondary. Um, he has been cut also, apparently. Whoever Corey Mayfield is has also been cut. No offense, but... Yes, I, I, whoever Corey I, I lo- love my guy Aaron Wilson, but, like, that 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 I that doesn't mean... I don't know what Corey Mayfield is and certainly was not... I'm sorry. You could say, aren't you supposed to be the sports guy? I, you're not going to get me to care about Corey Mayfield. I've got I've got a line that I'm not willing to cross, and that's not for me Corey knowing Mayfield. who Corey Mayfield no. is. Yeah. Sorry, maybe we'll turn out to be a great football player one day. So last night on ESPN, the Braves and Giants played, and uh, Ronald Acuna grounded into a double play here. Braves coming around on the ground. Davis. What was that sound? Alexander. <laughs> oh, they get the out. Oh, save. Wait, what is that audio? That it's was awful. I know uh, the the that was the bat. It was, I guess that was ESPN's field mic. Uh, that was, the that was what it sounded ball. like live on ESPN. Yeah. You can't hear the call. You can't. That's terrible. Play that again. That's Are you sure? dreadful. It's very loud. It's, it's atrocious. Braves coming around. On the ground, Davis. Alexander. Oh, they get the out. Oh, and all Shoot. of a sudden, the, the crowd mic level comes up out of nowhere. Bailey thinks he tagged. That's ter- I can't, I could I don't have the first guess as to what happened. Okay, well it was a double play uh, that they turned. It was a crazy one. It was a three-one-four. So the, it grounded to the first base. Yeah, the first baseman. He had to flip it to the pitcher because it was like he was like falling. It was like a it was basically a, a, a like a swinging bunt. Uh-huh. So he flipped it to the because he was falling to the ground. The first baseman was so he flips All it to right. the pitcher. Pitcher flips it to the second baseman who was covering first, and there was a runner on third. So they threw it home and they tagged the runner out at home. So but it was a three one four two first ever three one four two double play. Okay, all right. So I think I'm starting. To I was understand. trying to you know try and use audio to enhance uh, you know. Yeah, it didn't my... enhance anything. That I, I don't even blame the broadcasters because they're just reacting to the pictures. But like, 
the sound mixing yeah. is unfathomable for an ESPN broadcast. What it like to all of a sudden pull up the crowd mic in the middle of that? Play that one more time. <laughs> okay. I'm just so befuddled by how this is a network broadcast. Tapes coming around. On the ground, Davis. Alexander. <laughs> oh, they get the out. What is that? Like I jump every time we get to that part. Who in the middle? Who's Bailey in a booth somewhere? Like, him. you know what we don't have he enough of here? Replay. Crowd mic. <laughs> Got to bring that up more in the middle of the play. So bad. Or they had the crowd mic, I guess, pointed right at. No, the, no guess, th that clearly was a level going up. Okay. You could hear exactly the moment. It's not that the – like, that wasn't anything natural. Well, the it, fans got more excited, like, as they realized – No, 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 no. Play it one more time. Okay. You'll hear exactly what it is. I it's, mean – Rapes coming around. Wait for it. On the ground, Davis. Alexander. Oh, 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 they get the out. Oh, that's not the, – that's the level yeah, being right. brought up. Maybe – It's bizarre. So, yeah. I'm trying it's, to think because uh, you can hear the umpire yell safe. They overturned it, so that's why it was a double play. Right. Um, but you can maybe they turned on the umpire's mic or something, or? and they just weren't prepared to mix it. Yeah. Like this is just doing too much. Bad, 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 bad. bad. Uh, Corbin Carroll, he became the fourth rookie in Major League Baseball history with 20 home runs and 40 stolen bases in a single season. He is the second rookie since 2000. The first two, I don't think you'll be able to name. Uh, but can you name the other the other rookie to do it since 2000? No. Ich Ichiro. Not Ichiro. Since 2000. Yes. The other rookie. And just say the numbers again while I'm... There's 20 home runs yep. and 40 stolen 40 bases. 40 stolen bases. Acuna? Not Acuna. Tatis? Not Tatis. Closer. Could we go back towards 2000. Not too close, but... But 40 stolen bases is what's, what's getting me there. Um... I don't think A Rod stole forty bases. He did not. What was his rookie year? I, I yeah, it was probably before two thousand. Yeah. You're right about that. Yeah, it definitely was before two thousand. What am I saying? Um, man, it's the Hang only on. Shut, year. Just shut up. Shut up. Shut up. It. Shut up. Shut up. Shut up. Rookie of the year. Well, were they, do we know that they were rookie of the uh, year? Or just I, I guess we don't know that they were rookie of the year. I can't confirm that he was. He was rookie yeah. of the year. He was 20 nearly, home runs. He was nearly MVP. He's nearly MVP. I think. Wait, did he win MVP? Twenty, twenty home runs, forty stolen bases as a rookie, was rookie of the year. He was second in MVP. Yeah. Miguel Cabrera won the MVP. So it was American League player. Well, that means it was a time when Miguel Cabrera was in the American League. Mm hmm. So it was Mike Trout. It was Mike Trout. Okay. Yes, I, th I, th I, I thought you said go back. I was like going back. Well, to I was, yeah, I was trying to. I don't yeah, know. I, I was like well, thinking. I once I give you the year. Now I was probably, thinking the early two thousands. Yeah. That actually screwed with uh, me. It is a very rare feat. It is only. Uh, it, it's been. It's only happened a handful of times, and there are only nine players to have ever had multiple seasons of forty stolen bases and twenty home runs. Can you name the nine players to have done this multiple times? Say that one more time. Multiple seasons of forty stolen bases mm -hmm. and twenty home runs. Um. All right. How about forty stolen bases and twenty home runs? Yes. How about uh, A Rod? A Rod has not has not done it multiple times. He did it once with uh, Seattle. How about? I was gonna say, didn't he have a forty forty season? A Rod. Ooh, How sorry. about? He did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Trout. Uh, Mike Trout has only done it once. What? It was his rookie year. Bomb. Yeah, really. How about Barry Bonds? Barry Bonds had done it three times. I'll try Bobby Bonds because it feels like he's come up a lot yeah, on yeah, these lists. Bobby Bonds has done it the most. Seven such I like seasons. He's been doing a lot of home run stolen bases recently. Well, it's a, well, the stolen base numbers are up, so that's why I guess. Uh, Willie Mays. Uh, Willie Mays only did it once. Uh, only because I know he did it once, Jose Canseco. Jose Canseco uh, only did it the one time, so not multiple. How about Ken Griffey? Uh, Ken Griffey, uh, not on the list. Let me see if he ever did it. 
Starting to wonder. Starting to wonder. Starting to wonder what. Um, Ken Griffey not on the list. No. Man, I'm just trying to go to like 40 40 guys, right? Right. Like, because that's like the one thing I know. And I think the only other one that I didn't name is Soriano, right? Alfonso like, Soriano is on this list. He's on this list. Did it twice. So. Ugh. Man. I've got three. How many more are there? <laughs> uh, six more. So we can we can make it up. No, no. Okay. No. We can flip it too. Can you name the two Orioles? Shut up. That there did it two once. Two Orioles? That didn't do it. That did it once. That did it one season. 20 home runs for Brady Anderson. Brady Anderson is one of them. You'll I it, I'll be impressed if you can get the next one. Okay, tell me. Well, um, well, well I, Jeffrey Hammonds. Not Jeffrey Hammonds. He did it in the last uh 5 seasons. Did it in the last 5 seasons? VR? This, yep, Jonathan VR. I don't remember him hitting 20 home runs. I don't remember that <laughs> it being was the case. his best season. Um, Acuna. Did I say Acuna? Acuna only did it once. He only did a it a uh, bum. He's, this se- this season is the only bum. season that is the first time he's reached this benchmark. <sighs> Ken Griffey only stole the most b- stolen bases he had in a year was twenty four. You need that's a little surprising. Yeah. I mean, it's it's not that surprising because he's always more of a power hitter than he was anything else, but it's still a little surprising. I mean, I guess I should say Ricky Henderson, but I don't think he ever... Ricky Henderson. Did he really? Did it four times. Four such seasons. I mean, the stolen bases part is not the surprise. And it's not like Ricky Henderson didn't hit home runs. It's just that like he hit home runs that we would judge for like a leadoff hitter. We'd be mm-hmm. like, that's impressive for a leadoff hitter. Um, How many more did you say? Ty Cobb? Ty Cobb is not on the list. Are they, should we be naming old old timey baseball players. Uh, or are they modern. Yeah, they're more modern. More modern. The oldest one is from the. You got two more from the seventies. Tim Raines. Not Tim Raines. The home run hitter. Um. Boy. Got two. Boy. All right, it's twelve. 18. Two Cincinnati Reds. Two Cincinnati. Reds. Joe Morgan. Joe Morgan. I should have said that. Mm-hmm. Pete Rose. Not Pete Rose. This one is uh, from the nineties, nineties and eighties. Barry Larkin. Not Barry Larkin. I guess he wasn't with the Reds much in the 90s. <laughs> okay. Sorry. He started with the Reds. Came up with the Reds. Started with the Reds. Dave Parker? Not Dave Parker. I don't know. You confused Eric me Eric Davis. More. Oh, Eric Davis. Son of a. Had two no, such I'm, seasons. I should have gotten Eric Davis. Uh, then a Houston Astro. And they did end his... Biggio? Not, uh, Biggio is one of them. Oh, okay. There's another Astro from the 70s. 70s. 70s Astros. I'm not sure I can name any 70s Astros. What? Say, I was about to say it. Just what? Cesar Cedeno. Oh, Cesar Cedeno. Okay. Yes. Uh, and then one more, uh, and he actually was an Astro as well. Not not really known for being an Astro. But uh, it's because it was uh, Carlos Beltran. It was Carlos Beltran. In fact, so that is yeah, your... Yeah, these really are a lot of the same names as we've been doing on other... we got to break up doing home runs and stolen bases. Right. we got to come up with other things. All right, There's all right. a lot of the same... And I should have just guessed the same names, but I maybe I should have... I just sort of thought, like... Maybe they'll be different people this time. Right. Yeah. Basically the same names. Tubular is broad. That was dis- that's a disappointment. Jonathan we got what Jonathan Villar uh, mentioned. VR? Yeah. It's not Villar. VR. Uh, Tubular is brought to you by your local Toyota dealer, buyatoyota.com. The Toyota Tacoma comes in a range of models and trim lines, so you can choose the perfect Tacoma to reflect your unique personality and driving habits. Check out buyatoyota.com for deals and new Tacomas from your local Toyota dealer today. Uh, White Sox Orioles, 7 o'clock tonight, Mass and 2, Michael Kopech and Grayson Rodriguez. America East.TV, UMBC Soccer at home tonight against Old Dominion at 7.30. U.S. Open, our national championship is underway. Do not bother me with any of your other trivial thoughts. Coming up second today on Arthur Ashe, Francis TFO takes on Lerner Tien. That's after this one uh, okay. between uh, Sviantek, after that match. You can watch Francis TV, t- uh, TFO coverage all day on ESPN and ESPN+. Plus. Everything else, uh, ESPN2, Las Vegas Aces, New York Liberty at 7, the USA Network for WWE Monday Night Raw tonight at 8. Some non-sports highlights? Sadly, no. American Ninja Warrior on NBC, and yeah, that's it. It is uh, the series finale of Miracle Workers, which is the uh, Daniel Radcliffe show on TBS. All right. All right. Very good. Stars on Mars, also season one finale. Ah, I'd have to catch up, though. Yeah, you would. I'm not going to do that. I heard you might be able to tune in tonight. Yeah. 
know thanks what's going on. today to uh, Gary Renicky. Thanks to Jeremy Kahn. Thanks also to David Sampson, as well as to Eric Arditi. We'll get all of it up in the greatest hits section of the. Oh my God, it's so good. Tab at GlennClarkRadio.com. Uh, tomorrow, Gavin Sheets is mm-hmm. checking in. Yes. Baltimore native in town with the White Sox. Probably means he's going to hit three home runs. That's the way that it works. And uh, Greg Rosenthal is going to check okay. in. Uh, my buddy, former uh, co- podcast co-host. Of course, you see him on NFL Network. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about that, but also a lot about the U.S. Open. That's what we do. Of course. Thanks to everybody at PressBox, all of our great sponsors and partners, including Visit Baltimore Live Casino and Hotel, the Maryland Five Star, Glory Days Grill, Dorchester County, the Bowie Bay Sox, Royal Farms, Costa Sin, Superbook, Baltimore Orioles, Birdland Sports, Easy Pass MD, Washington County, the Maryland Cycling Classic, your local Toyota dealer, buyatoyota.com. Thanks to Griffin at Griffin underscore Bass. Follow us Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at Glenn Clark Radio. Have a great Monday evening. Go Birds. Duke sucks.